What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Golf 360 Podcast. I'm the host, Pete Popovich. So you may be asking yourself, what is Golf 360? And Golf 360 is a show that was designed to introduce you to people associated with the game of golf to help you improve not only at your game, but also your life. Almost all of our guests are from within the industry in some way, shape, or form, but some of the guests we have are from outside the industry, and it mainly revolves around the business world with a few others scattered in here and there. Now, all of the guests that we have have a few things in common. One, they all were highly successful and accomplished in their field. Two, each has something to pass along that will help you in your game and your life. And three, they were all more than willing to give back by passing along the things that they use to help them in their career and even some of the mistakes that they made so that others don't make them in their journey. So I hope you find listening to them as enjoyable as I did interviewing them and that each and every one of you benefits from the information that they so willingly and graciously pass along. This podcast is brought to you in part by Just Thrive Probiotic. You may be surprised to learn that your digestive system is the key to creating and maintaining the quality of your physical, mental, and emotional health and it's one of the body's most essential systems. That's why the majority of nutritionists today highly recommend probiotics as an indispensable nutritional supplement. As a discriminating consumer, you've probably been searching for a probiotic that is proven, potent, and effective, and you found it. Just Thrive is your best choice for maintaining a healthy lifestyle. Just Thrive Probiotic captures the power of hundreds of thousands of years of nature's design with a specialized bacillus strain formulation that guarantees survivability through the stomach and upper digestive system. Supports optimum gut health, digestive health, immune health, and delivers antioxidants. Great for adults, kids, and the whole family. Use promo code GOLF360 at www.thriveprobiotic.com for 10% off your order. This podcast is brought to you in part by Old South Golf Links. A short ride across a bridge from Hilton Head Island is one of the area's finest golf courses and a hidden treasure. Set up on towering pines and ancient oaks with sweeping march vistas, truly makes Old South Golf Links a -a one-of-a-kind golfing experience. The Clyde Johnson design was named one of the top 10 new public courses when it opened, and it also takes full advantage of the natural beauty of the low country. Old South is a fun and unique challenge for golfers of every skill level and a favorite of both locals and visitors. Whether it's your first time here or you're a regular, you'll be treated and feel like family. From the bag drop to check-in at the Fully Stocked Pro Shop with both men's and women's apparel, to breakfast or lunch before or after your round, the staff is always ready and willing to help. Experience for yourself why Old South is one of the premier golf courses in the Hilton Head area and why it will quickly become a favorite of yours too. Visit them in person or online at www.oldsouthgolf.com or to make it tea time, simply call the Pro Shop at 843-785-5353. Welcome, hackers, touring pros, weekend warriors, and everybody in between. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of the Golf 360 podcast. I've got a great guest for you today, and we just finished wrapping up a short time ago how he is not in the top 100 or the top 50 on every instructional or coaching list. I have absolutely no idea, but it's a travesty that he's not, but I'm sure he's going to be there very soon. Um, His name is John Sinclair, and he has the Sinclair... um, golf school in Euless, Texas, which if you don't know where Euless is, is not very far outside of uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, But John is on the cutting edge of the use of technology, and not only is he a coach and instructor uh, to a number of different touring pros and high-ranking amateurs, uh, but he also uh, does a lot of research and lectures around the country and around the world. Uh, A couple of the things that he uses uh, that we get into in great detail that you're really going to love today is the Golf Psych program, where he is one of only three master uh, instructors of that in the, in the world. Uh, he utilizes the 3D AMM system and is a golf motion master specialist under the legendary Dr. Phil Cheatham. And if you don't know who Dr. Cheatham is, I hope to have him on soon. Uh, but look him up on Google and just uh, let your jaw drop as you read some of his information. Uh, John is also an advisory staff member for 4D Motion, which if you haven't seen any of that, that is really, really some cool stuff. Um, he also, uh, just to add to his resume is Dr. Kwan's level one and two certification in golf biomechanics, uh, and that training program. 
Um, and he has uh, a couple of videos on his website that I highly, highly recommend. His latest is uh, all about um, the different wrist angles throughout the swing. Uh, it runs about two and a half hours, but I highly, highly recommend it. It's very much worth the watch. It's called It's the Motion, Not the Position. So, um, again, John gives a ton of information. He explains all this technology that he uses and why it's so beneficial and why you should be using it if you're looking to improve your game. So, give a big Golf 360 warm welcome to today's guest, Mr. John Sinclair. All right, I'm here with uh, John Sinclair. John is Sin- has Sinclair Golf in Euless, Texas. Um, John, thanks for coming on the show. Well, I certainly appreciate it. It's been a long time coming. We had a chat about it, and now we get a chance to do it. Yep, and I, uh, most of that's my fault, everybody. I want to have John on um, close to the beginning of the year, and I just I couldn't get, get uh, situated, and then uh, schedules clashed, and then, then we ran into the – craziness that we're in today but uh finally got you on i'm very very happy to do so i think everyone's gonna uh have a lot of uh or you're gonna have a lot of interesting things to say and a lot of people are going to be pretty impressed with uh your information um been teaching much during this time um are you you been shut down there in, in texas no we got shut down in uh pretty much just this course in this area kind of shocked me but uh basically just us there's been a few other courses closed but the the course opened last week and uh, they still won't open the range until about the 18th so um i've been doing uh, videos (laughs) so and doing a bunch of online teaching and uh, stuff like that but uh no there's no normalcy to what's going on but it did allow me to finish a, a fitting video i did for tpt and a uh, like a fitting course and then i've just finished up my uh, mental routine and focus video that i think it's on my site right now but i'm not 100 percent sure H- have you found that that the the downtime has given you time to pursue some interest that you <clears throat> or ideas you might have had <clears throat> excuse me before and and maybe it it uh You've had enough time to, to develop it, and, and it propels you on another direction once we come out of this? Yeah, actually, I think that has happened. I was I was heading in a little bit different direction before it happened and just wasn't sure exactly how I was going to do it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I've, I've taught seven days a week for the last, you know, 20 years, and everybody – everybody laughs think that's not possible until they look at my schedule and they go, wow, you work 340 something days a year. And I go, yeah, I sure do. And, uh, but I don't notice it and I always like it. And, and, but that kind of, when we get in the middle stocks, that kind of focus that actually I have just, you know, kind of wears you down a little bit. And so when we were starting to, I was kind of shifting my paradigm a little bit as it uh, started to wanted to do, you know, all the requests I have to do some videos and do some different things like that uh, has just been piling up and I hadn't had a chance to do it. And and then I kind of wanted to shift my coaching more to uh, long term as far as, you know, when people come in, I want to I want to do more than just an hour. I want to start I start stretching that out to about three hours, half days to full days like I do with the tour players. And so when this hit at the same time, I'd kind of made that decision. And when we come out of it, that's just pretty much the way it's going to be. I'll be uh, doing very few uh, hourly lessons, uh, except for some, you know, just a few of the the people that have been around for a very long time and and that like that kind of thing. But I will shift to doing uh, my amateurs and my my mini tour players more into a full-on tour player type coaching atmosphere if that's what you want to call it Mm -hmm. and you're um you're stable so to speak um are you allowed to say who you're working with as far as the tour pros or that i know a lot of guys i can say but i I never do i mean i just i always feel like that's their that's their business not you know I work with them and if they want to go out and say, Hey, you know, John Sinclair helped me, then that's great. But I've just, you know, coming from a golf psych background and then also the 3d information that I gather from, you know, I've been fortunate to, to gather all these players that I have and, 
And so I've just always just kind of went, you know what? I, I'm just not giving up that information. Mm -hmm. And that's just the way I've done it. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm not going to change that part. But uh, just so everybody knows, you, you have a fairly decent size grouping of, of tour pros who utilizes you and all the information that you have. I, uh, oh, sure. Yeah. Right. So probably uh, over the years, probably uh, worked with probably 60 plus tour players and their coaches and then my own that I just coach individually. And then, you know, I do some uh, mental work with some. And so I'm kind of eclectic in that regard. And, you know, I have whatever it is, a hundred plus, I hadn't counted lately, 120 or 30 actual uh, tour players on the PGA tour in my database that I've collected over the years. And uh, so, yeah, I have, I have a lot. And then I have some young up and coming ones that I look forward to seeing out on the PGA tour soon. Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting that, that you have that many players and that you've worked with that many players as well as their coaches to help them. Um, and, and I got to meet you at, at Andrew's coaches camp. Uh, but for some of those who, who maybe just see your name in, in golf digest and in, in top teachers in Texas, I find it almost amazing that, that you're not in the top hundred or the top 50 at least. Um, but the, the, the fact that these people who rely on you for, to, to help them make their living are coming to you in, in more than just a couple here and there. They're coming to you in, in numbers. Um, just shows that the, the difference between the real life versus, let's say, some outside organization doing a ranking system. Yeah, and, and all those ranking systems are fine. It's just not something uh, that I'm after. So I, obviously I'm not going to apply uh, the, it's just not one of my goals. So the, uh, and I don't have any problem with anybody having that goal. It's just not one of mine. I, I did win the teacher of the year here in the North Texas section. <laughs> it's kind of funny because uh, they called me and said, Hey, you're a finalist. I'm like, great. That's cool. And then they said, they called me back later and said, you know, the next day you won. And I finally asked him, I said, well, how did I win if I didn't apply? <laughs> you know, I thought, did y'all change the rules or, or what happened? And, and, uh, I was a little confused and he goes, what do you mean you didn't? I'm reading your stuff right here. And it dawned on me, my wife had done it. And, uh, so I give her that award because she's my, my everything in my right hand. And so I always tell her that's her teacher of the year award. Cause she filled it out in one of those papers, you know, that we have our wives get us to sign. <laughs> I sign it. And, uh, and it, to be honest, it turned out to be, one of the best things is uh, I really enjoyed that time and then going out and, and being around the other, you know, teachers of the year and, and the experience was actually really, really good. And uh, so I don't regret it at all. And, but it's still not something that I'm going to uh, pursue, but I would encourage anybody else to do that and try to get on that list. And if that helps them, then that's great. Yeah. I think one of the benefits is, as you said, it, it, it gets you together with other people who obviously have similar interests and, and the exchange of ideas and the, the, the growth of everyone involved or sitting in that room or at that table is, is a benefit to all those there, all the students they work with. And it's just for the advancement of the game in general. And I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I, I've never been one to pursue a, or have a goal of pursuit of being a, recognized as a teacher on, on a plaque outside of having students call me up and say, Hey, I, I, I played really good. Or what we've been working on uh, it worked great. Or I won this, or I, you know, having much more fun or things like that. So, um, I, yeah, when, well, I figure if I'm, if I'm a top 10 or top five or top two instructor to the one standing in front of me, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you and I agree at, that, you know, we had lunch some time ago. We, we have a lot of commonalities and, and agree on a lot of different things. And, uh, one reason I asked you to come on here. Not that we agree. It's, it's good to have differences, but uh, I think today's going to be a lot of fun. Have, have you, um, so one of the big topics in the sports world is, is the documentary, the last dance. Have you been watching any of that now that, you know, there's really not a whole hell of a lot of sports on TV. <laughs> Actually, no, I really wanted to watch that. And I got so wrapped up in finishing this video that I was uh, editing that the whole time and so i've missed it i've heard a little bit about it but i'm i'm definitely going to watch it as soon as i get a chance it, i actually watched good. a lot less stuff uh during the apocalypse here than i have 
uh, other times. So I've, I've actually kept myself pretty busy. Well, I'm, I won't ruin it for you, but, but one of the things, and, and this kind of leads into the, what we're going to get into on, on the things that you do is, uh, that really struck me was, and I think everybody's seeing it, uh, was Michael Jordan's mental capacity and, and the way he looked at the game and, and things and his competition and so forth. And that kind of leads into, uh, what I want to talk to you about first. And that's your golf psych. Uh, if I'm saying it right, is it golf psych or psyche? Nope. Just golf psych. Golf psych. Cause you're a master in that certified, um, instructor in the world. Uh, for those of you who don't know, and if you don't check out John's website called SinclairGolf.com. Um, but uh, c- can you just talk a little about it, and then uh, we'll just run from there? Yeah, well, it's a, a system that uh, I ran into when I was playing back in the 90s. And, you know, I struggled. I was, you know, I was talented. I could hit the ball. I could do everything that a quality pro could do. And just it wasn't materializing for me. And I had been to a lot of different golf psychologists and, you know, we've gone around this and, and that wasn't uh, resonating either. And in fact, when I would go to these people, uh, different ones, they would always tell me to focus more that I was distracted. And the amazing part is, is nobody ever actually tested me or diagnosed me. They just said, well, obviously, by what you're saying, you're distracted and you need to focus more. Well, well the funny part is, and what they didn't realize is, is I could. But my problem was I was not focusing on the right thing. And so I would spend all this time practicing all day long, hitting balls. I mean, I still pay for it now because I can hardly straighten my arms. But the I would play in a tournament in two or three weeks, and then I'd get to a point where I couldn't even get out of bed. And it wasn't like I was in physical bad shape or anything, just couldn't figure it out. And you go to the doctor, and there's nothing wrong with you. And then I read an article on uh, Dr. Deborah Graham, and I went to go see her because I thought that sounds more different than anything. I'd ever heard of. And so I went to go see one of their programs or something. I can't even remember exactly how it all came out now, but I got tested. And I want, I remember one of the first things she told me is you need to go to a movie. What are you doing? You know, cause I tested on the most extreme part of focus, right? So if you imagine a bell curve, you know, I am so far out in some other galaxy and the ability to focus and, I was killing myself. I was wearing myself out. That was the problem. Mm -hmm. And she diagnosed me and, and she gave me some tools, some mental tools to go out and distract myself actually is distract myself in between shots. So I wouldn't be so laser focused on the ball or the outcomes or things like that. And it was amazing what happened to my game. You know, I, my wife and I started traveling around back then. We were, you know, it was the Nike tour or whatever. And and we were traveling around and we started taking days off where we would go to the zoo or a, whatever the town would, would have that would be special. And we'd do that in my game. My score started going down. And and uh, the last three years that I played made more, more money than I did the first four and tripled it and won a bunch of tournaments. And and I really, when I decided, woke up one morning, I decided I wanted to teach. The first thing I did was call her. And, you know, this program had developed through all that and we wanted to get it out to amateurs. And so I started working with her and uh, John Stabler and developing schools and stuff like that. So we could get it in the hands of amateurs and then a lot of study and lo and behold, they asked me to be a master and that's kind of where it's gone. And, so what we do in this program, and now it's been 23 years that I've been with Dr. Graham and Joan Stabler. So what we do in this program is you take a simple personality test and she went to Baylor and she earned her doctorate and wrote her thesis on this study. And she went to the LPGA in 1981 and gathered all these players I don't quote me. I, th- I think it's around 88 players to take this test. And she found eight personality traits that the champions had that the average tour player didn't have. And 
this is the study she earned her doctorate with. And it was amazing to see that these players that are holding all the trophies were the ones that were thinking and had a personality like this, had eight personality traits, and they hit these personality traits in the 95th percentile statistically. So in 1988 and 89, she went up to uh, the senior tour and the PGA tour and tested the men, and the test came out the same. So it didn't matter if you were male or female. Um, you had these traits that the champions have. And, and the criteria was you had to win a couple majors and some other events to be, you know, in that category. She didn't set these categories at first. They just came out this way when they crunched the numbers. And then or win one tournament for every year on tour. So these players like a Nicholas or a, a Tiger or, you know, Miller Barber or whoever you want to pick, um, they they truly thought different because we can all agree that, you know, you're on the PGA Tour. The skill levels are pretty, pretty similar. I mean, we're dealing I know with my players I'm dealing with. We're trying to shave a tenth off, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. a tenth of a stroke here or there in their games. It's not like, you know, we're lowering somebody's handicap from a 15 to a to a five. I mean, we're trying to, you know, get every little little piece we can. So these guys skill level are off the chart. And then why is it that you have these players and you mentioned Michael Jordan? Why is he so different? You know, and those those types of things. But this was the only study ever applied to golf. This is golf. You know, this is psychology scientifically applied to golf. It's not sports psychology that encompasses all sport. So we're very golf specific. And that's, you know, under the golf psych belt, I think we're at 32 or 33 majors of players that uh, golf psychs worked with and 400 and some odd amount of events that have been won by just the professionals. So it's a really good system and it really works. And so that's, that's how I got involved in it. That's kind of in a nutshell what it is. You know, it's interesting what you said about yourself and that you were focusing too much. Um, and as I brought up some of the, we have a lot of similarities on, on, from talking with you at lunch and, and at, at the camp. But um, when I was playing, I, I had a similar problem that they didn't know. But when I was training, I was training at, there was a local Hell South, uh, if you remember back to the late nineties and there was a, um, psychologist on this, uh, in that building. And he had, he was friends with one of the psychologists for the Olympic team. And they had this device that they put all these, you know, the electrodes and stuff on your head and they wanted to test how well you could get into the zone. And I said, okay, let me try it. And, and I maxed it out and I thought I was the king shit. And then he said, okay, <laughs> now, now we're going to test how well you can take yourself out of it. And he runs me through all these tests and, and, uh, I'm thinking, yeah, I nailed that one too. And he comes, he says, you realize we ran the test, right? I said, yeah. He said, well, you're supposed to, to get out of the zone. I said, I did. He said, not, a ch- not even close. <laughs> you, you, he said, you hardly even budged it. So I, I could put myself somewhat into it or what everyone might call the zone or in this high, super high focus level, but I could never take, or I could, had a very difficult time taking myself out and, and like what, Wrong with me was when you say you didn't want to get out of bed. I, I used to play a couple of weeks in a row, and and my head would hurt. It would just be fried. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, you just see massive that, headache. Yeah, you could see yeah. that in my scores. I'd, I'd have two or three good rounds, and then it, I'd, I'd shoot 76, 77, or 78, and I'd shoot myself out of the tournament. Or or depending on how many weeks, the third week, I usually shoot the bad round early. Then I go, I'd go. i say I'm not going to the range. I'm not going to practice or anything. The next two days, I'd play well. Um, but, yeah, like you, I wish I would have had it sooner. Um, yeah, and that's a. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't actually wish I would have had it sooner or anything like that. I, I actually think it worked out perfectly, and you know, it was my choice to quit playing and start coaching. And I think uh, I've probably helped more people doing it the way I did it than I would have ever doing it just playing. How how and, does that differ from someone like Dr. Howard Gardner, who has his eight intelligences? Um, what does he have? Uh, spatial and kinetic, uh, uh, audio, uh, auditory, uh, and interpersonal, and interpersonal, all those, and or Carl Jung's theories. Yeah, to be honest, when you look at, you know, 
psychologists that are dealing with golf or sports psychology, what you find if you read one book and then go read the other book, mm -hmm. it almost appears that they plagiarized, you know, because it's really, they may say it a little different or, or things like that. I think I've, I've been uh, recently, the last one I read was some stuff with Stephen Yellen and it, it would sound very similar to something I would say, but there's truly only one right answer. And so all these people are coming at it from these different angles or different words or however you want to call it. And, and you kind of always end up in the same place. So as far as how somebody differs, they differ more in the language, but probably not so much in their overall system to outcome. I'll, I'll say it that way because, it you know, I always recommend they go, what psychology books should I can read? I'm like any of them. Just pick one. The only thing that I recommend people do where the golf psych would be different would be the actual test. Because, like, you're telling me right now, well, I have my head hurts. Yeah, well, I'm going to go. That sounds a lot like you're a very focused person. But I was saying those things and people were thinking I was distracted. So without testing you, I would never make that assumption. So the players that come in to see me that don't get tested, I don't assume their personalities. I and I'm very vague, even on the mental stuff. I, you know, even the the mental routine video I just finished, I I had that more broad and general sense to it versus when I'm working with somebody that I know what their personality is, and then I can give them those specific tools. But because I was misdiagnosed, I'm very skeptical about guessing what somebody's personality is. And so I think that would be the only difference that I would see. Is that a test that? Uh Dr. Graham and, and John Staber came up with and that you utilize, let's say that you, if someone calls you and says, John, I want to uh, start working with you. Is that something you would send to them ahead of time? So that when, before they yeah, come they, in, you have an idea. It, yeah, they do it online. And uh, what it is, is it's a very well known test been around forever. It's uh, 16. It's a 16 can tell 16 PF. And it's a, uh, just a personality profile. It takes, and then, we give two tests, but both the tests takes about 45 minutes. And, and the other test, we actually ask golf questions on. So there's the simple personality profile, and then you have the uh, mental skills profile so that we can actually see, okay, well, your personality lines up here. Now, how are you doing on the golf course? So we can see, you know, where are you changing? You, you know, maybe you have good focus. And on the golf course, you don't. Or maybe you have like a Miller Barber would be somebody that have a wide focus personality. But on the golf course, he learned to focus doing his certain mental pre-shot routine. So we can now see both ways. Uh, you know, what are you doing on the golf course? And then what are you just as a person sitting in front of your computer relaxed? Yeah, it's interesting how in different settings people will different parts of their personality trait will come out. So if you take somebody in, in a golf competition and, and they're really focused, dialed in, but then like you would, like they told you to go to a movie, I would have to imagine you were completely relaxed and just into the story or, or the, whatever was happening in the show. And if somebody were to had measured you, your heartbeat probably would have been down and you're just in complete, uh, your own little Zen world. Yeah, not not concentrating so hard, mm -hmm. you know. It's still focused. I mean, I still get that way. I mean, my wife will come in and kiss me goodnight and leave, and then all of a sudden look up and go, where'd she go? And I'll go, <laughs> where'd you go? And she's been gone an hour, you know. And uh, so it still happens to me. And, and uh, But if you learn, you know, even when I'm teaching a, a lesson, let's just say, and I'm in my bay, this is how it helps me now. I'm in my bay and then somebody walks in for the next lesson or something and they're in the, in the lobby and I, there's a window there and I know they're there. Well, if I don't go and take care of that person right then, get them some balls, get them out the door to go warm up or all that. Well, I can't now focus on the person that's front of me because my focus has shifted. Mm -hmm. And so I teach myself these little tools that Dr. Graham and John Staler had taught me in golf to even use in teaching like a, a picture being, you know, crooked on the wall well if i noticed it in the middle of a lesson if i don't go fix it i'm not going to give a very good lesson <laughs> you know so i got to go over there i got to straighten it up and then i can come back 
and and get it back. So these little quick little things that you can learn to, you know, do to yourself um, on and off the golf course. You know, as you, you can imagine, if I was shooting low, I might get really focused on the number or, you know, shooting high, I might get really focused on the bad number instead of just that moment in time uh, over the shot. And so I would learn how to, you know, widen my focus and narrow my focus and widen my focus and narrow like a rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we try to teach people. And depending on where you fall on the scale, whether you're a wide focus person or a narrow focus person, your mental routines might be a little different. But the overall outcome will be the same. And and like you just said earlier, people can move their personality uh for moments in time to get a job done. You know, like when I built this place, I'm already at 10 on, on dominance, which would be a very aggressive personality gambling and all that kind of thing. And then, you know, I built this building and spent every dime we had. And then all of a sudden I retest and I'm a, I'm more conservative, you know, cause I was, I had to take that risk. And so I had to be that dominant person to make the decision. And then I want to protect it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then you, you, you'll change just depending on your, your circumstances and you can do it at will once you learn about it. As far as, so, um, let's say that the narrow focus versus the highly focused, can, can you run us through maybe a, a sample of each of uh, someone you've worked with just so that whoever's listening out there will, will can have somewhat of a idea of, of what the process is that, that you go through with them? Without giving well, like away, I, you know, you don't, I don't want you to give away exactly what you do or else why yeah. would they come see you, right? But no. j- maybe just a brief, um, so you, for example, you, you send them the, the, the uh, test ahead of time so they can fill out and Correct. you can review, right? What, what would be yeah. the next step? Then they get the test back. There's It's about a 45 to 50 page report on both the test. Mm-hmm. So we just ask them to read. It's easy to read. It doesn't take very long. And then we come in and then we sit down and go over the eight personality traits of a champion and explain them. You know, this is what this means. This is, you know, being comfortable. Is this you? Do you feel like this test has, you know, accurately portrayed you? And as you read it and start to learn about the personality traits, um, we'll take focus for an example is a uh, very focused person, like a number one like me on there would be somebody that would be an aloof personality, an introvert, you know, very, you know, focused. Some people call me rude because I may go into a store and walk right past you after I just spent five hours with you, maybe even bump into you and never notice you and get my little thing and get out. Very often I wouldn't know if it's a male or female that checked me out. And sometimes I have to go, Oh, did I pay? You know, (laughs) just like, Whoa, (laughs) you know? And, and so, you know, or a wide focus personality would be somebody that would walk in there for whatever milk or something, talk to everybody in there, buy everything in the shop, meet everybody's name and then leave without the milk. And, you know, so very distractible person, but very warm hearted, friendly, lots of friends, things like that. And so when we know those two personality traits, the focus person, I can sit down and go, okay, now what kind of person, you know, what kind of mental pre-shot read, routine do you want and we're going to probably more make sure that they're distracting themselves in between shots whereas that warm personality we're probably going to want to have them have a routine that's a little quicker you know up by the ball a little closer so if a butterfly you know we don't want to have a butterfly fly by so we want to limit that amount of time that a butterfly can come and distract them so that'd be kind of a, a simple way of of looking through that and then we can go through a abstract personality trait which is somebody that may overanalyze variables to somebody that may miss some variables and so we can add those traits into their routine to maybe a a high analytical person we're going to make them hey what's your first impression of what you should do in this shot somebody that's on the concrete side we would say you know go through some kind of a, a a list not a written list but a list where maybe they throw up grass maybe they walk around the pot you know just so they know that it's uphill or they know that the wind's blowing and they won't miss such a variable so that'd be kind of a simple idea 
that you go through. And then the other traits aren't as much a part of the mental pre-shot routine and more about, you know, game planning and, you know, there's self-esteem in there and there's tension control, there's thought controls, you know, emotional stability um, on the shots and being tough minded and, and being in control of who's making the decisions and, and things like that. So w- would someone like a, a Lee Trevino be the, the wide focused where he's very jovial, very talkative. And then when it comes time to hit the shot, he focuses in. No, we would put that on a, that's there's, we measure actually 32 personality traits. And so a Lee Trevino would be what we would call probably a, an enthusiastic personality, mm-hmm. which wouldn't really mean, you know, that's not one of the eight traits. And where you would throw Hogan on the other side would be a very sober personality. So there's two champions on either side of the scale. And, and But what we'd want Trevino to do is talk, is, you know, be himself when he played. And same with Hogan. And you can remember Hogan was actually documented trying to be friendlier to the media, talk to him. And he just played horrible. So on those on that personality trait, we really want the player just to be themselves and go and play that way. So a a Trevino, we would encourage them, Hey, talk, have fun. You know, it's one problem that we have with the kids and the parents are going, look at him. He's not, he's just not paying attention. It's like, no, that's just who they are. You know? And then like, you know, the Hawk Hogan, you know, he's over there and everybody's going, look at how rude he is, you know? (laughs) Right. But you know, he just can't play where he's just jabbering at everybody, you know, and I, I, Lee's one of my friends and mentors and, and uh, he's taught me so much over the years. And I always say that, that uh, he's the only person I know that asks me questions while he's hitting a ball. (laughs) And in a hundred percent honesty, he has no idea what question he's asking me anyway. He's just talking. And I told him this, Oh, I saw him in Palm Springs here not too long ago. And I, I told him this, I said, Lee, it's taken me all this time to figure you out. And I finally figured out, I said, you're talking and you don't know what you're saying, but you've created this bubble where everybody's frozen around you and nobody moves. Nobody talks, nobody jingles chains. Nobody does anything. Cause when Lee's about to hit, he's commanded everybody's attention. And it's a really fascinating thing. And he didn't, he was like, Oh, I don't even know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. And so I'm at the airport. This is a great story. So I'm at the airport and I was like early. And so I just sit down over there and my phone was out of juice. So I got it plugged in and, and I didn't, I just talked to Lee about this. Just, I can't even remember. Maybe it was that morning or the, the day before, but I didn't know we were on the same flight. So he comes around the corner and I saw him and all these people start seeing Lee Trevino want to take selfies and, and doing all these things and i just did my thing and next thing i know you know he's standing next to me he starts kicking me and he's like john you know stand up you know so i stand up and said yeah lee and he kind of puts me up against the wall where everybody's behind him he says you know i love all people and he goes but i just can't take pictures with everybody on the plane (laughs) and talk to me (laughs) and so he starts i didn't say a word he just starts talking right so he's going on going and going and I said, Lee, finally, I said, Lee, you're doing it right now. You've created this bubble where nobody's stepping forward. Nobody's coming to you. I see over your shoulder. They're all looking at you, (laughs) you know, but nobody's even coming near you. And he's doing it right there. I said, this is what I was talking about. And uh, we laughed, had a good time. And of course, the the first class gets called and he said, well, come on. I said, I'm not in first class. He goes, he goes, where you are right now. And he grabs me and we go on the plane together and we get on the plane and he goes, where are you sitting? I said, back there. And he goes, see you later. <laughs> so, so, but that's his, that's his deal. And I think that's an awesome understanding of somebody where, you know, that's not one of those eight traits. Um, but it's definitely uh, something that he really needed to be, to be as great as what he is. And where Hogan, you could never even talk to him hardly. You know, I've had a couple of run-ins with him cause I'm here from Texas And, you know, nothing wrong. I mean, with him or anything like that, it's just like you're not going to get too close to him or you you wouldn't when he was alive. So Mm -hmm. very different personalities, but both 
just fine for playing golf. So you had mentioned, and maybe I got this wrong, but there's 32 traits, but there's really eight identified that that the champion's uh, mentality focuses on? Correct. So there's 32 traits, and they're actually it's a scale. It's a bipolar scale. So there's 16 bipolar trait, you know, 32 traits, 16 lines of bipolar traits. Like, you know, cool versus warm, that would be focus and wide focus. Or like we just said, sober versus enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. Those are bipolar opposites. And so there's 16. And on eight of those 16 lines, they would hit in a certain area, the champions would. So we have like a shaded area, like on it's a scale of like one to 10. So you can imagine you know, 10 boxes and, and a, a champion on the focus trait would end up in a three to four box if they would hit it. Um, and then if they're not, depending on what side of that box they're on, they're on is the techniques we would teach them to get in that box for that few seconds over the ball that we need them in that box. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's eight of those eight out of those 32, those places. Um, so that's what we call the focus trait, abstract trait, emotional stability. And then you have dominance and then you have uh, self-sufficiency. You have tension and then you have self-esteem. So those would be tough minded. I didn't miss one. That was only seven. So the other one will be tough minded. So those are the eight actual traits of a champion golfer. Interesting. Th and they're different. They're different. I know she did the study on, uh, this is what's important too. there. She did a study on, uh, NASCAR. So she works with some NASCAR drivers and their set of traits is different. So a football player would be different. A basketball player would probably be different. So that's why this is specialized towards golf. Hmm. Specialized in a specialized world. Correct. They uh they they have a book, don't they? Uh, on yeah, on the eight. That, yeah, the eight champion traits by Dr. Deborah Graham and John Stabler. Yeah, I think you could probably get that on Amazon. You can get everything on Amazon, can't you? Yeah, you can get it on there. It's, I think it's like whatever. It's eight to fifteen dollars, depending on the week. I think something like that. So just listening yeah. to you, I'm, I'm going to get it. Uh, you sold me already, but uh, for anyone out there listening, check that out. Uh, you can get that on Amazon. Yeah, I'll, easy I'll read. The, yeah, I'll have it in the show notes linked and everything else. If, if anyone wants it, just click on that link. Yeah. Uh, but very Super interesting. Super easy to read. Doesn't take long, and it's it's good. And again, like we originally started talking about is that, you know, any book is really pretty good. And, and you'll start to read it and go, hey, you know, I, you know, I went to whatever, Vision 54. It sounded a lot like that. Well, yeah, because that's what it is. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. Vision 54 has a think box and a play box. And golf psych, we're more about a commitment line that you cross. I mean, well, there's not any difference. It's just different verbiage. And uh, but the answer is the same. If somebody reads that, they're not going to get themselves try to self assess and get themselves all wrapped up to where they're. No, and actually, she has uh, just uh, she had in the book. There's ways she asks you questions, so you can kind of get a a pretty good sense of where you might fall in the book. So when you're in the book, it's kind of giving you the ideas of hey, if you're this and this and this, you're going to be about over here. So she's already kind of giving you. You know, the book kind of does almost a little self-test, mm -hmm. small self-test on it. So it's, you know, nobody will ever get messed up doing that. Yeah, hopefully a bunch of people are on Amazon right now, putting in their cart and clicking the buy now and uh, getting their uh, mental game all situated, playing to the it's way the only, they're It's the only, book that I, the only book that I have that has ruffled edges. Are, are you, are you, uh, you mentioned you'd been working with them for here we're coming on a quarter of a century. Did, did you all have any updated book coming out or working on any new books or anything no. like that? No, it's just pretty much the, it is what it is, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't even know how you expand on it. I mean, you know, it, it, the answer is the answer. I mean, it's the only measurable definition of the zone I've ever seen and you can do it. And then we, we she's done all the research over all these years. I mean, this goes back to 1981 and it's pretty much is what it is. It's simplified. It's, you know, it's a simplifying a complex 
issue, I suppose you'd say, but, um, you know, I, I look at it all the time and I try to see if there is improvement on it and there isn't, you know, I mean, it is what it is. It's, you know, I mean, you could probably, you, you'd, you'd probably just have to repack, package it and brand it a different way and say all the same things. So I, I don't know exactly how she would actually improve on it. What, uh, why is it, do you think that most, it's like the, the mind, it, it, it's probably the most important thing, but it's the last thing that people want to work on or that coaches want to teach. I actually have is? a theory on that. Yeah, I, I actually have a theory on that, and it's something I go over my lessons a lot. And my theory is that we're not telepathic. <laughs> and so <laughs> from, a, from a very early age, our parents, you know, I, my, my analogy is always, you know, that the, the little kid's walking across the floor and the little kid falls down, you know, and what do the parents do? They go over there and, you know, not a bad thing to the parents, but they pick them up and say, little Johnny or little Susie, you know, pick up your feet. You, know, you got to pick up your feet. And so from that point on, every mistake we make is a has to be fixed physically. So imagine going back in that time and if we were able to be telepathic and we were able to actually have a communication with that child at that moment that would be meaningful. We could ask little Johnny or little Susie, well, you know, you walked all the way across the room and then you fell down. Why did you fall down? And they could have told us in some way that, hey, well, I was watching the butterfly. And then the actual true fix for that problem is not to pick up your feet. I mean, they knew how to walk. It was to, hey, when you see a butterfly, stop. When you get through watching it, carry on. So the reason wasn't that they didn't pick up their feet. The reason was that they got distracted. And, they, and so I try to get across to my clients that, you know, when you miss a shot, you're sitting in the bay and you miss a shot and the, the club face is wide open. And I say, what happened? Why would you do that? Well, I left my club face open. I'm like, well, I can see that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I get it. I didn't have a track, man. And there it is. It was six degrees open. I got it. I said, but I don't know why it happened. Did you want to do that? Was that your intent? Did you intend to go through that and and have that club face open? So I'm more about let's find the real reason. You know, and where we're going to find that most likely is between the brain body connection. You didn't give the proper instructions. You didn't do the visualization and the feel and the commitment to what you were doing. And you got distracted and you worried about birdie. Or you worried about, you know, whether your arm was going to be tucked in or your whatever things that anybody works on physically. And you missed the shot. You know, if I throw something at you and you catch it, you're not sitting there going, well, I got to open my hands. I got to do all this and start giving verbal directions. But as golfers, because the ball is still, we give all these verbal directions before we swing, while we're swinging. And then we wonder why we can't put the club on the ball the same. And, you know, at any level, once you've learned a motor skill, the only answer I know of for you not repeating that motor skill, if you don't have some neurological problem, right, some disease mm -hmm. or something, would be that you didn't give the proper instruction. That's why the club face was open. You know, I, I give you even a better analogy to that. I had a, a guy come in, eight handicap, comes in. This has been a few years ago. John, you know, this is awful. You're my working on this driver swing and it's just not any better. And I keep messing up and it's awful and you got to fix it. And I was like, me, I got to fix it. <laughs> I'm not going to fix it. I said, I can explain it, but I'm not going to fix it. And so I said, well, let's just see, you know, what's going on. We're sitting in the bay. True story right here. He hits 15 balls out of the bay as good as you could ever hit one. I mean, not as far as a tour player, but he's flying them out there like 260, 270, right down the middle. I'm like, well, I just don't see anything. Let's go out on the golf course. So we go out there and stripes it down one, grab the ball, stripes it down two, grab the ball, skip three, it's a par three, go to four, stripes it down four, standing on five tee, 
He's going through his routine. Everything's fine. And about that time, when he looks down the fairway, two coyotes come out of the bushes on the right. I see him look straight at him. And then he comes down, he hooks it in the tree, and I thought he was going to kill me with the club. <laughs> and, you know, he's over there, this is what I'm talking about, you know? And I said, dude, slow down. I said, what, what happened? What, what were you doing that was different? I wasn't doing anything different. Nothing. I said, dude, something's different. I mean, I watched 15 shots in the bay, and now we're out here, and you've striped three more. That's 18 shots in a row. That you didn't miss, you know, 10 yards down the middle of the fairway. I said, did you see those coyotes? And he goes, well, yeah. And he's, you know, grumpy, right? And I, I said, well, did they bother you? And he said, no. And I said, no, the fact that you saw them bothered you. You should have backed off. You distracted yourself. You, the brain-body connection was severed right there. That's what happened. If they hadn't have bothered you, you would have said, what coyote? That's what would have happened. And you just stripe that one right down the middle. Mm -hmm. So do you want to go back to the range and you want to work on your swing for the next three hours? Or do you just want to understand what happened? And that's the best way I can kind of sum it up, you know, of why people get so fixated on a physical fix to a mental error. And I think that's where people go down the, the, the drain is if you had a mental error and you spend time working physically to fix it, you're wasting your time. I've had a lot of friends uh, ask me that playing at the high, at, well, I didn't get to the PJ tour, but playing at an extremely high level, uh, why some guys can just dominate. And then the, the, they get, they get to the nation. What was it now? Corn fair, they get to the PJ tour and, and they struggle. Um, and I, I explained to them, look, it, it's, I, I viewed it or explained it to them as, well, th there's different variables, right? When you, you're playing with your buddies, there's really not a whole lot of variables because you're used to all of them. So nothing is new. You, you know how to handle it very efficiently. Uh, if you go to the next level at tournament golf, now maybe it's self-imposed because now there's a fixed score or it's external, creating an internal issue. But y you get to the highest levels. Now you got cameras, you got galleries. If, if you don't work at, not even paying attention to those things, it's going to have a dramatic effect. And I, I give them the story that the, the first, this was going back to, I think, the mid to late 90s. The Florida Open was still a fairly big event outside of the big tours. And it was the first big event I played in, at least. And I, I was leading, I think, the second day at the turn. And you got guys like uh, back then, Gary Nicholas and Tim Petrovic, and I'm sure there are a whole slew of other players. And those guys are all about six seven years older than me but um I, there were probably half a dozen to a dozen cameramen following our group taking pictures and all that stuff and i said oh, i must be leading and next thing i know i go double bogey bogey double bogey <laughs> and then they left of course because i wasn't leading anymore and then i got my head back on straight and i i you know i made the cut fine and ended up i don't even remember what i finished but um, i tell them that story to say you know if you're cruising along and all of a sudden out jumps this thing that you're not used to and you don't know how to handle it that can throw your game off because you're like your story you're paying attention to those things you're not paying attention to what you should be doing correct and then you know then the biggest problem with seeing golf uh is they'll go work on their swings mm -hmm. because the camera bothered them. and you know that's just it's the wrong way to do it. But again, I'll go back to that's what we know. <laughs> you know. That's how we train is we believe that this magic muscle memory will solve all of our problems, even when they're distracted. Well, I'm hate to tell people, I'm sorry. Your brain tells your body what to do. And if it ain't telling it what to do, you're just not going to do it. it. It could pick anything could happen. If you're just sitting there going swing, well, any swing you've ever swung could come out. And chances are it's going to be one you don't like. And you're not telling your body what to do when you get in these situations. And then if you can't come to realization that, you know, I was sitting there think about thinking about winning. You know, I'm standing on the first team. I'm wondering what the cut is. You know, and, and you don't realize that that's having a dramatic effect on your physiological being and you can't swing the same once you've raised your level of arousal that high. 
I don't care how much you practice. The swing just feels different. Mm -hmm. And we have to manage that and understand the adrenaline that's pumping at any given time to know when we're going to hit the ball further or, you know, what is making me nervous? You know, I love Jack Nicholas always said, if he wasn't nervous, he knew he wasn't playing well. <laughs> right. And he would use those nerves to help him focus. So he would take that thing that usually crushes people and turn it and make him respond, which is, that's a champion, right? That's an abnormal, abnormal thought process. <laughs> and, and, you know, we got to understand these champion golfers and Michael Jordan's, these are abnormal people, big time. They're not normal. And so therefore we got to understand that to be in that situation, we need to probably do things that we normally wouldn't do in order to fix the problems. Yeah. And I think perspective plays a role in it too. And, and what I mean by that is I remember the, was it the first or second time I went to Q school and, and, and I was really nervous uh, the night before, uh, more so than most. Um, and I called a friend of mine and he had played the tour back in the early, late fifties, early sixties, you know, the old, that era. And I was I just needed to talk to somebody who had been there and I'm talking to him about it. He said, well, look, it's not that it's so much that you're nervous. That he said, look at it more as you're just excited to get going. And once he said that, and I kind of processed that, it was like, yeah, it's, I really want to get going at this. So it, it wasn't a, a negative nervousness where it's like, what's going to happen It's like, I, I, I want to get in there and I want to get, I want to get playing. Um, yeah. I think and, that's perfect analogy. And that, 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 there's a, that perspective just completely changed everything. Yeah. There's a, there's a nervousness of uh, somebody jumping out from behind the dumpster in a dark alley nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there's a nervous of, you know, something of, of you getting to go to the amusement park, you know, which is actually an exciting, good thing. Right. So, or, uh, you know, there's a difference when a, a puppy walks through the door and a wolf walks through the door. <laughs> a little bit different. <laughs> right. I mean, there's a different set of nerves that click, you know? And so most of the time, most of the time for players in a situation of a tournament and you're excited and you want to make the cut and you got there and you're playing it's the puppy mentality. It's not the wolf, but we turn it into the wolf and we just got to make sure that we, uh, just, you know, discern those two different kinds of, uh, nerves. Yeah. And, and we could talk on this for the entire episode, but, uh, because you have so much stuff and I want to introduce everybody listening to a lot of it, let's jump into the next thing that, that, um, you have and it's on your website. And again, for anybody that wants to look at it, um, they can purchase the video and, and uh, watch it and, and really learn a lot. And it's from your presentation. I think it was the uh, at the PGA Coaching Summit. So not uh, does that that sound right? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the uh, PGA Teaching and Coaching Summit. Yeah. It was uh, that was the start of it. I only, that was that was just like a, I did like one foot of the wrist angles, and everybody really wanted more. And so this is what two and a half hour video ended up like. And it's so, called wrist motion. Uh, it's motion, not position. Right. It's the motion, not the position. Correct. So can, can you just. And there's actually back for the mental game. I think as of now, there's a mental, you know, we talked about the mental routine. There's a mental routine video on as well for players and coaches uh, if they want to watch that. So, yes. Yeah, so be sure again, uh, Sinclair Golf, right? Sinclair Golf. Dot com. Yeah, SinclairGolf.com. Yep. And again, I'll have that in the show notes. Everyone can click on it. So the, the wrist motion, can, uh, uh, again, it's two and a half hours, and we're not going to, we're just going to touch on it to kind of introduce everybody to it. Can you kind of explain a little bit about what it is and what it encompasses? Well, what I did is I decided to take each motion of the wrist, you know, radial ulnar, flexion extension, and then supination, pronation of the forearm, and separate them out, both hands and go through each movement individually and then start to bring them together as one motion so that people could really take a good look at uh, what was actually happening in the wrist from the time you take it away all the way to the finish. Mm -hmm. And so it's pretty complex. And so I just, you know, parceled out each little thing and, and tried to bust some myths that were in there and tried to explain, you know, the difference between good lag and bad lag. And, uh, you know, tried to spell the, the ideas that your forearms are swinging through and, and not rotating, which, 
they rotate very fast. So uh, there was a few things in there that I just wanted to make sure that people understood. And, and that goes with my database of uh, uh, tons of players. I think on that one, I have to go back and look and make sure. I think I used the, my database with the highest ranked players in it. And I can't remember how many actually players I put in that particular uh, video, but I think it was 60 or 70 players. And, and I took the top money earners and the top players and I put them all in there. And I didn't use my entire, you know, 120 players on that video. When you um, found out that you were disproving some long held notions, what, what, what were a couple of the, the uh, bigger ones? Or, or, or the most um, uh, accepted that, that turned out to be incorrect. The biggest, the biggest one is the lag, mm -hmm. you know, and that's something that's been taught. Uh, it's even being taught to this day because I just, like three days ago, saw a, a instructional video that was uh, teaching it incorrectly. But you know, when people see in a two-dimensional video, the shaft and the forearm create this angle. And they're assuming that's lag. Well, the first thing you're going to do is grab a club and pull it down and extend your lead wrist and probably flex your trail wrist. And you're going to get this look in a two dimensional camera um, that will be opening the club face. And uh, Joe Mann and I had some kind of an argument one day about wrist angles and so I just flew out to Vegas and we captured all these amateurs. And, you know, one of the criteria was they couldn't uh, have had lessons. And so we captured all these amateurs and that never had lessons. And even the good scratch golfers. And none of them would close the club face before arms parallel. We did 20, I think it ended up being 25 players out there. And then I had another uh, 15 in my database already. And that was the one thing that came out. And to be honest, I don't even remember what we were arguing about in <laughs> the wrist angles. But I remember when we looked at it versus a tour player. The tour player will always start to close that club face very close to the transition at the top. So, so tour and, pros are going into flexion sooner and amateurs are staying in extension of the lead wrist longer. Well, no. I don't want to say it that way. Okay. I want to say they're moving towards flexion sooner but it's both hands it's the lead hand is moving towards flexion right away and the trail hand is moving towards extension because mm -hmm. you can move your lead hand to flexion and then you're also move your trail hand to flexion and then you're just casting it away so it's both movements that kind of coincide for the lag and then what what the amateurs do is move towards more extension and move towards flexion with the trail hand and more extension in the lead hand. So I just want to make sure, because that's why that video is called, it's not the position, it's the motion, right? So right. when we get to the top, the one thing that people don't understand is the lead wrist angle at the top, they're between the two furthest apart that I have on the PGA Tour, and this goes through my whole database, it's a hundred degrees. So I got a, I got a 40 inflection at the top and I have a 60 in extension at the top. Both of them, everybody would love their careers. I'll just put it that way. So, so okay. just for, I don't mean to cut you off, but just as so some of the people that are listening that, that might not know the terminology, uh, flexion is when you're, if you're right-handed, when your lead wrist, your, your, fingers are bent towards the inside of your hand extension is when the back of your hand is bent more towards your forearm yeah so right. if you have your palm facing down and you lift your hand up then that'll be extension and if you push your palm down that will be flexion all right so everyone listening that now, now, now they might that they have a better understanding of what you and i are talking about right so when you get to the top what i found that particular you know and, and the whole world right now is trying to get us you know the flat left hand or lead hand mm -hmm. and and my question even at, at coach camp was why give me a reason why that's going to be better for golfers and i don't i don't see where there is a that is better for golfers because i have all these millionaires that are 100 degrees apart so i look at that as style 
this is a style thing and it's really dependent on the grip too, because the stronger grip guys are going to go to the top and they're going to be in more extension and the weaker grip guys will be more in, in flexion and, you know, as a general rule. And then the players that go longer, say like a jet John Daly or a Fred couples are going to go to extension. And then you got the shorter players like a, you know, John Rom or a female, they're going to be uh, in flexion. So it's, it's a style thing. It's, it's, and it should match up to the player's style, how they end up at the top. But the motion should always be a closing motion at the top. So there, when we look at all of these graphs and we look at the motion of the player, the guy that's at 40 degrees of inflection at the top versus the guy that's at, at uh, 60 degrees of extension at the top, their motion will look very similar. It's just the position will be vastly different. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And so that's where it comes through. And one, the one thing I point out, the ones that are up there, and I've only had one player not do this, but the, the ones that are up there at the top in flexion, they'll actually move towards extension and then move back into flexion. Whereas the ones at the top in, in extension will just move a straight line all the way down just before impact to flexion towards flexion some of them don't even get into flexion so there's your other part that you're asking what other weird things that are happening well is everybody's been trying to look at that flying wedge or have their their hand bowed or flexed at impact and what you don't realize from those still pictures is that a frame earlier than what you're seeing that thing was more flexed so that wrist is going at a very rapid rate towards extension through the impact. And it's not, you don't want to try to hold and keep that wrist flexed all the way through the ball. And that's been a big fallacy out there as well, because you get a still picture of somebody that, you know, came down, maybe they hit the ball and then they hit the ground and then their hand might have got a little bit more flexed. And then you snap a picture and go, Oh, that's where I want to be. That's my player. And that's that's been a pretty good fallacy. So both of those things were pretty huge in the finding. And when you look at the top of the go back to the top of it, it's the trail wrist that has a smaller in flexion extension that has a much smaller window from all of our tour players in my database than the lead wrist. And to me, everybody's been looking at the wrong wrist. So the focus on it for a co for the coaches listening or the instructor should be more on the trail wrist than the lead wrist. If you're looking for positional data, you're gonna be it's gonna be a lot tighter there. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't even look for the positional data. I look for the you know, the motion. I want to see that club. You know, close. I call it closing early so it doesn't have to close late. You know, in, a, in an amateur, you know, they pull it down, they open it, and they've got their arms parallel, and that thing's got to go more than 90 degrees to get square to the target, they're in big trouble. Whereas the tour player starts to turn that face back away from the target at the top. And then all you have to do at that point is just keep going. Right. And then the club face is going to get much more square. And I think that has a, a big reason why they're so much more consistent. And I'd say it's a, it's a big reason. Yeah. It goes back to the old adage in teaching that, uh, less relying on timing how many times have we all heard that one yeah that's probably fair enough for that for sure i mean then you know then we can get into the whole rate of closure discussion that's whew, that's craziness but, but, but let, uh, me, let me interject real quick because you, you had told me that story you were presenting to a a group that was philosophically different than what you were presenting um should, should could you just as we deviate just a little bit and jump off track, could, could you tell that story? Or do you, you want to stay on this for a little while longer? And yeah, because because I thought that was get, a pretty interesting sure. story. <laughs> Are you talking about oh the 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 uh, closure to path? Yes, is that correct? Yep. Okay, yeah, just, you told me that. Yeah, I, I went to speak at uh, a group of of instructors that believe that you can make a swing that you know doesn't close to the path, and that's just wrong. It, I mean, maybe a putter you can do that with, you know, a, a very small chip, but any real functional golf swing, you're going to have that face will be closing to the path. 
and it's just a it's a fact i mean i i can't get it any other get it any other way around it um i don't mind the idea of teaching somebody a certain field that may not be uh technically correct but i was there to give correct information and i did and of course everybody freaked out <laughs> and so it was me against you know 100 something uh, uh people and to be 100 percent honest it felt like i was you know an astronaut that had been around the world a bunch of times, you know, in the, in space and talking to the flat earth society. And, you know, they it just didn't comprehend that. Uh, and I know I, I read some of them cause I had, you know, tons of instructors uh, email me after that to, to learn more, but you know, it's just, I think it baffled them. And then they tell me that, well, you, you know, you're not, you're incorrect because you can see it in the, in the video and so my question back was so you're telling me that your two-dimensional video is invalidating my three-dimensional measurement i mean that <laughs> that on the face of it didn't make any sense to me and they said yes you can clearly see it on the video and i was like well i mean i don't have anything else to say right at that point and you know it is what it is you know i have you know every phd which is several that i work with have you know agreed with this you know, the way that I capture the machines that I'm using and the information that I get. And I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. It's like my uh, so, 10 of diamonds trumps your ace of spades. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, and, and, you know, again, what you teach to get somebody to do something that can, you know, that can be anything, you know, but when you're conversing, you know, pro to pro about facts and what's reality and what's happening. I really like to be as accurate as possible. And, and when I'm wrong, I'm wrong and that's fine. I've been wrong about a lot of stuff, but you know, that one, I'm not wrong. On. <laughs> I'm just not wrong on that. One. All right. I uh, didn't mean to, to knock you off track. So back to the uh, wrist angles. Um, we're talking about uh, coming through impact and, and how the trail and lead wrist change from flexion to extension. Yeah, well, the trail wrist will go into flexion very hard, very late. And the uh, lead wrist will then, right before impact, go towards extension. So the, the trail arm, you can imagine like you're throwing, like a pitcher's throwing. So this this arm comes through and the, the hand flexes when the ball's starting to be released and then it actually rotates in what we call pronation, which if you, you know, if you take your thumbs and you stick them straight up in front of you, you know, your hands like clapping motion and then you rotate your thumbs inwardly, that would be pronation. And then if you rotate your thumbs outwardly, that's supination. So if you can imagine that right arm coming through, it's supinating, 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 and then right before impact, it's pronating very rapidly. And then, going into flexion very rapidly like you just threw something and then uh, the lead the lead hand is you know supinating you know we're going to go arms parallel so you can say supinating very rapidly that whole time and at that point it's flexing and then right before impact you're going to continue to supinate really hard and then extend that wrist so you shouldn't feel like anything's holding on or holding off or anything like that. You just should feel like everything's just let go. So th was that the, the, the second thing that you had found in, in, in the research and, and the, yeah. and working with this was that the, the arms do pronate and, and supinate? No, no. The, the flexion extension of what people's perception of what happened. Okay. Everybody, I think everybody, I didn't think that was such a surprise. What surprised me is, is there was golf, pros out there that think that didn't happen <laughs> never surprised me that it happened i mean but uh it surprised me that there was golf pros out there that thought that that physically didn't happen that uh -huh. the supination pronation was happening how else are you supposed to hit the ball i i, I don't know but i certainly have a conversation with somebody one day and he was i thought he was joking <laughs> and he wasn't and uh then i went and actually looked it up and figured out that uh there's several that think that and again that's another great concept if you know to kind of get across to somebody maybe if that's what they need and uh 
but if you're being factual, it, it you know, it's kind of like the, the square to path. Well, if my forearms are moving both of them about, a, you know, let's give or take a little bit, a thousand degrees per second, you know, rotating your forearms, how are you going to keep that face square to that path? That's just not going to happen. You know, and the shaft's twisting around it, you know, if we're talking about a, a driver, it might be, you know, on a low one would be 700 degrees per second. Mm-hmm. On a fast one might be 1800. I mean, that's just, you know, when you start wrapping your head around that idea, you know that it's just those things aren't going to happen. The the, um, the the wrist motion program, the, the only outside of you, the only one I know, and, and I'm not. I'm not out in the golf world as much as a lot of people, but from, from what I watch and see and read and, and, and all the other things is, you know, I, Scott Cox, and I hope I say his name right. I, you know, he, he does a lot with, I think he has hack motion. I don't know mm-hmm. how much that differs from what you have. Um, um a lot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, a hack motion is a lot like uh, 40 motion, which I have. It's an inertial sis- sensor system. Um, you know, they're going to get rotation of the hand, but not the forearm. Um, it's going to be very reliant on your ability to uh, snap a line, calibrate accurately each and every time. I look at those things as more of a training aid. I mean, they're fine. They're fine. Um, but the hack motion only does the, the left hand. Um, it doesn't do the right hand, so it's a little limiting there, especially when you start talking about, well, I just told you the left hand at the top or the lead hand would be style. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the, you know, but it can certainly be used for that, and it's fine, and uh, I think it's a good machine for training. But for research, um, I, I, I struggle with those types of things and that kind of research. So when you're trying to do research of, uh, kinematics, positional data, you need something much more accurate than that. You could do, do great research with uh, velocities of rotations and stuff like that with inertial sensors. Um, they're really good at that, but they're not so great at positions. The, um, but uh, uh, along the lines of, uh, so you, you have that, they're, they're, let's say hack motion is, is a, in the same realm. Okay, you you already said it's not the same thing. It doesn't have the measure capability that that what you're using does. I, I think Grant Wade, I think saw one day saw him had something with wrists. But where I'm going with this is, along with the golf psych stuff, is how come nobody is utilizing this stuff as as much as they should? They're they're focusing on, as you said before, uh, holding off release and looking at positions at the top instead of the transition. Um, yeah, I just think you know people didn't. You know, you have your preconceived notions and you've probably been teaching and you probably have success. So why change? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just kind of searching for more answers. And, and, you know, like I tell everybody else, I mean, you don't have to have all this technology to be a good coach. Placebos work. I mean, you don't have, I mean, golly, I taught people for a long time without technology and they got better. And I was saying all kinds of stuff wasn't true. And it's just more that I want to know. Not that I couldn't teach the other way around. I think it makes me a more well-rounded coach for sure because I understand it better. But, you know, I mean, those things, I don't know that it's it's so necessary. So, you know, they they just probably don't adapt it like I do or, you know, like a Tyler Farrell. You know, he's into this stuff and, and it costs a lot of money. I mean, when I bought the AMM, it's like, you know, it's $30,000 or whatever it is. And, you know, we, that's a lot of lessons, you know, to right. make up for that. <laughs> to break and, even. Yeah. And it's, you know, you don't buy, I didn't buy that stuff to make money off of it. I, and, and maybe I did, you know, over time, but I bought it to learn. I didn't buy it to, to make money and, you know, doing research and making money do not coincide. That's <laughs> not a good, you know, that doesn't go together. <laughs> Especially when you you're know? somewhat of a pioneer in it. Right. So, you you know, people have to realize that, too. And that, you know, that has a lot to do with it. But, you know, you've got uh, James Lights. You know, he was I think James and I were, you know, kind of in on it on the AMM stuff at the same time. And the TPIs, Greg Rose and all them kind of all started that stuff at the same time. Um, 
And so there's just not that many of us, Dr. Phil Cheatham. And then, of course, you have uh, uh, Rob Neal, Dr. Neal. I mean, he's got a lot of wrist motion stuff, but there's there's that's so hard to capture the wrist accurately. And Dr. Phil Cheatham, obviously, he's the best. I mean, he's done it the best of anybody. And he's in everybody's system, too. That's, that's uh, you know, all these people I've already named, you know, it's it's Dr. Phil's uh, programming and algorithms. So he's really the one that's nailed the wrist down and made it capable us capable to actually measure them as good as what we do. That's a very intricate motion. And it's not easy. And for an inertial system where you have to hold your hand steady and make sure it's exactly zeroed out every single time in the hack motion in like the 4D, well, that just makes it difficult. And I don't even think it's that necessary if you have somebody like me that's gone through it. Now I'm telling you what the motion is. Mm -hmm. Well, who cares what the number is? I mean, hack motion will give you the motion and fine. That's all you need. You can use some biofeedback on it. And so will 4D. 4D gives us all that same stuff. You know, 4D is just a little more versatile because you can put it on any part of your body and hack motion is just the wrist. So that makes it a little more limiting. But then again, maybe, it'll, you know, somewhat, you know, attractive because it only does one thing versus a 4D does a lot of things. How, how so, has this changed uh, your philosophy or your outlook on teaching? In other words, what, what has it taught you that... that before using it, you say, I, I know this absolutely to be true. And then you went through this and you learned it and you dialed it in and you're like, holy cow, that I don't know how I thought what I did before I started with this. Is there anything like that? Well, or has I, it changed? Yeah, I'm it? sure. You know, that just the lag part. You know, I mean, I would guarantee you 15 years ago, I didn't quite understand that. And and probably, you know, had people pulling down on the handle or a rope or not probably I did. I'm not going to say probably I did do it and, you know, doing all these things that I thought were correct. And, you know, guarantee I screwed some of them up, you know, at, at some level and then maybe somehow talked my way out of it to end up helping them. You know, I mean, I think we've all had that idea because it wasn't like I was just losing, you know, I was always making people better. But sometimes, you know, you didn't realize what you were doing. You know, we used to, you know, tr before TrackMan came along and, you know, really the D-plane was explained properly. I mean, I I know me and several other people thought, you know, the path of the club is where the ball started. Mm -hmm. It's not, it turns out it's not a bad feel for a player to have, you know, it's not a bad feel. So th there's some benefit to that idea, but it's just not true. And I think under, when you understand those things a little better, and to this day, a lot of people's brains are confused of path and face even though they even know the, the right answer, the, they get those two things in their subconscious confused because you'll tell them, okay, well, I want you to open the club face and then their, their path moves to the right. <laughs> I see that every week of my life. Right. So, you know, they're confused with that. So I think, you know, the, the technology where that's really helped me is to be able to, you know, look at things the way that I see them. I never did see the two dimensional camera as correct. I went through a time where I thought I was wrong and the camera was right. And I went through that period until Dr. Neil showed me 3d for the first time. And then I was like, Whoa, that's what I see. You know, I was like, immediately it shifted my paradigm back to where that's why I'm just so messed up is because I'd look at the video and I'd scratch my head and I'm like, Man, if that's right, I'm crazy. And, <laughs> you know, and when I saw the 3D, that really opened my mind to say, that's what I see. You know, that's what I see as a coach. I'm teaching in a 3D world. And we still to this day have all these players that, uh, you know, and, and coaches that look in the 2D world. And that's where it's helped me just see more of reality and see what I, what I'm experiencing when I'm standing in a room with somebody else. Cause you see in three dimensions. And when I turn around and, and, and look at two D's, it just kind of gets crazy. And that's the other thing when you, when you talk about, I don't tell which players that I have or this and that and the other, 
the number one thing people want from me is for me to tell them what 3D graphs and pictures of what tour player uh, I'm showing them. And the reason for that is, is not because it matters. I, I don't believe this to be true. I said, but I think what it is is so that they can then go look at a 2D picture to explain it to themselves instead of, you know, <laughs> oh, well, that was such and such. So I want to see the video. Can, and I ask that all the time. Well, can you show me a video? I'm like, but that's 3D, dude. I mean, what do you want to see a video for? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, that's a better info. video. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I mean, that's what you're seeing when you're standing next to the player. And, and so, but, but that's the way I, we've been trained too. That's kind of like going back to the original walking, you know, a lot of our teaching came out of the video age. And so we're just used to seeing it. And that's why also all these people worry about having that video camera exactly in the spot every single time you take a picture. But if you get into the 3d world, and then start looking at, you can tell exactly where the camera is. And so then you can then tell exactly what you should be seeing in that two-dimensional picture and make a pretty good analogy. I don't care where they give me the video from. You know, heck, we got parents that are taking out of the trees, you know, their kids because they don't want the kid to see them taking a film, right? Mm -hmm. And <laughs> we get them from all over <laughs> angles. And so if you... You know, to me, I just want, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't have to always educate every single player on where to put the camera and just send it to me. I'm fine. And then there's certain ones that, dude, you got to put the camera here because, you know, they're going to look at it. And once you have a player, you know, that's obsessed with looking at their their videos. Uh, last thing I need them to do is learn how to do all that. I'm going to make that player put that video in the same place every single time so that they don't get screwed up the um you had uh your your uh, one of your presentations was that i listened to was you your opening was uh when they discussed 4d i think it was and you brought up a very interesting point in that in the golfing industry you know somebody comes up with something new and it's like everyone wants a, or not everybody but a fair portion of the people who might disagree that want to tear it down but if you looked at mm -hmm. most of the rest of the scientific community and they come up with something new, they're they're at least early on they're saying, "Wow, this is great. Let, let's see where we can take this and and we can adjust as we go." Why yeah, do you think that I, is? I, think, I, I don't understand the, the the negativity side of the of the coaching business, but you you hit the nail on the head on that one. Yeah, I think. Um, I, I guess I don't know. Maybe ego gets in the way. Maybe. Um, you know, I don't know how many times I'm sitting there on the on the lesson tee and, you know, we all have clients that watch YouTube out the wazoo and they, you know, and they're questioning that some other instructor said something else. And, you know, then you got to explain yourself or something like that. Maybe people get tired of that. And so they want to just say, you know, well, I'm right. And that's that's it. And, you know, so I don't cr clearly understand it or I wouldn't have put it up there in that particular presentation. Mm -hmm. I just found it fascinating. I, I believe it's it's a, you know, science has come up with a possible fifth force. You know, there's four recognized forces and then there's some certain things when they're splitting atoms that aren't happening according to those laws of nature. And so as a scientist, you look at that and go, wow, that could answer a lot of questions. You know, let's figure it out. And then they start experimenting and it could all get debunked next week. But they're all just excited about it. And then, you know, maybe it gets debunked and they go, oh, well, well, we tried. You know, that was cool for a minute. But you don't see that in golf. You know, you don't see that in golf. And maybe because they're so protective, you know, maybe because they, you know, it's it's I want my proprietary thing, you know, to have and. And when somebody comes out with something and then they won't show it to you, I turn off right away. You know, I mean, I'm interested, right? I'm super interested in, you know, something new. And then as soon as I hear, well, don't worry about it. Trust me. Well, I've been down that road <laughs> way too many times. Right. And so, well, when you're ready to really reveal it, then we'll pay attention. Um, but until then, I mean, what do you do? So, I think 
we're all better if we can share our little things that help. Um, but if we get in there and we want to show something and then we don't want to say what it is, well, that doesn't help. You know, and, and eventually I, I would imagine it would drive clients away from me, too, if I wouldn't tell them. You know, I tell them all the time, if I tell you to do something and you ask me why and I don't know the answer to that, you should leave. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if I'm going to experiment and say, hey, let's try something, I'll just tell you. Let's just try this, see what happens, right? And we've all done that. Of course, sometimes you're like, dude, we'll just try it, right? But if I tell you to close the club face sooner in the top of your swing and you ask me why and I have no answer for that, then, you know, I, I don't think you should be standing here. Now, if if you ask me a question that I don't know the answer to and I go, I don't know, then now I got to go figure it out right now. And then I'm going to come back to you and go, I still don't know, but I'm working. on it. You know, <laughs> you know certainly the the uh, the torques that are going into the club with each hand is something that's fascinating. me, And we can't measure and it's, you know, kind of gets, you know, we're missing all that data from the club head to your hands and. We kind of have an idea of what happens, but we don't know what each hand is exactly doing. And that one's that one's going to be to me. That's almost the holy grail at this point uh, for, you know, I work with a shaft company and, and I do those things, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to load a shaft and make somebody hit it straight or farther better. Uh, that information is pretty important to me. Mm -hmm. And getting it right is probably more important. What uh, what what's the difference? I mean, this might sound like a dumb question, but the, you have the three D AMM system and you have the four D. Mm -hmm. The can can you explain the differences between those for again? If, yeah, if we're, and I have the just, gears. Yeah, and, and yeah, you got a lot. I mean, you got the gears, you got Trackman, yeah. Sam Putt Lab, the Golf Psych, you, yeah, Doctor Quan's bomb the mechanics, and I mean, you you got everything. It's no wonder you're highly sought after. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about that, but I got a lot of stuff. My wife attests to it. She's taking and <laughs> cut the credit card up. She's like, no more until you do this. Sell more videos, and then you can do You can have the force plates that I want. But mm -hmm. the, the difference in those, they're just different technologies. And what I stress to everybody about technology when you buy it, when you research which one you want, is understand how it works. Because I've already screwed up for you and I've spent a lot of money on things that turn out they don't work. And so what I started to do is truly investigate. And I've helped all of those companies that we just said develop their product. Because I get in the middle of it and I test and I do things and I give them ideas. And, and with any luck, I help them make things better. And understanding what each one is good for is important. But, you know, if you look at my wrist angle video and then you go out and get a hack motion or a 4D motion and then you, you know, that's why in that wrist angle video, too, you don't see a lot of numbers. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the motion because I don't want people running out there and then going, well, you know, I now I can do the wrist because I have a, a 4D motion. Well, the truth is, is Dr. Phil Cheatham did both. He did the the algorithms on the 4D and the MM. So. They're as close as they can be, but an inertial system, if you think of the little wafers that they have on your head, on your arm, you know, the, the two that are on your wrist, they don't know where the other one is. So it's just this thing on your hand, right? And then this thing on your arm. And unless you have a program, which makes it very complicated, that tells them the exact to the millimeter, how far they are from each other, they don't know. So that's what makes it a little bit more dicey for positional data of, say, the wrist. So what it's doing is going, OK, well, when you turn me, I got a gyroscope in there and I got these things, you know, compass, I got all these things in there. When you turn me, it moved this many degrees and it is extremely accurate for that. But in relationship to the other one, not so much. Does that make sense? Yes. Mm hmm. So, you know, even on the 4D, if I do a full body, you know, my right femur may be a little shorter or longer than my left one. And so I'm not going to get that precise, accurate data. 
And so, but as far as spinning and jumping and, you know, how fast this thing is going, perfect. Those are going to be great. So then you turn around and you start talking about the AMM system. The AMM system is a electromagnetic system. So we have those sensors on your body. And the absolute best way that I know to explain it is we have this. It's a receiver that sits behind you that projects this. I call it a receiver. It's really projecting. It's projecting this electromagnetic field around the player. And I call that the sun. Right. And then these sensors that I put on your body are the planets. And then I put little moons around each of those planets, like around your wrist or around your joints or all these places. So I know the exact center of each joint and I know where those points are in relation to that planet. And I know where that planet is in relation to that sun. So it will give me an accurate body. So when I actually put you in the AMM system, and I pull you up as a little avatar, that's you. And if I put, you know, you are much taller than me next to me, you'll be able to tell the difference. I look like me and you look like you. Mm -hmm. And, and if one arm's longer than the other, and all the time we go through and we see somebody and all of a sudden one hips a little higher than the other one. And sure enough, okay. Yeah. Your, your legs longer. You know, I mean, I can even see it when somebody has spikes on one side of their shoe and not on the other. Because their their hip will be a little off, and you go, "Hey, dude, look in there. You don't have any spikes." But you know, we can see that, and so that's why that accuracy really ramps up a bunch. Now you still have skin, you know, motion and stuff like that that you know taints it to some degree, but that's why that's so much more accurate in the positional data. And then you go over to like a gear system, which is an optical system or Qualysis or, a, you know, an Enzo or all these different ones that we've heard about the optical systems and Qualysis. I don't know if I mentioned that one. There's one out there like that. And uh, so those what those are doing is those are cameras, which you need to have at least a couple of cameras. See one of those little ball markers that are on your body or your skin or your clothes or whatever. And so they can also be very, very accurate. Because the amount of pixelation we can get out of cameras now, we can really center up that ball if two, you know, cameras can see it. Most gear system, uh, they have eight cameras. The one I have has ten, and so we got to we make sure that we get two cameras that can see a one of those little reflector balls at all times, and then you get really accurate data. And where that would maybe have a little bit of an issues is the, uh, you know, if you're putting on your clothing and your shirt moves. So that's why you see these tight things that they put on you with, you know, so that stuff can can move the least amount as possible. And then you go up to like a Dr. Kwan uh, and you see these pictures up on the, the Internet where he's got you down in some spandex and all those little <laughs> markers. Are, you know, we don't see very many, you know, non-perfect bodies up there getting measured. <laughs> because you're in these little tights and and uh you know and that but again that's how out of an optical system that's how you're going to get the most accurate data so there's all these little things and like the amm we got wires right and and if i want to make it wireless i have to give up some accuracy which i'm not willing to give up yet and so as far as a golf pro uh goes to me, the AMM has produced the most accurate data. And when I go and present this information, all of my players have been captured on AMM. And if I was to go then and go, okay, I want to use my gears to capture all these players. Well, there's enough differences that the data that I've captured over the last 15 years would be rendered almost useless because it's different. So, also, when people are trying to disseminate what you saw with uh, Scott Calx or, you know, doing the hack motion or what you may see with uh, 4D motion, 4D motion is a little different when you see the actual numbers because I actually put my AMM data in it. So those are actually my database numbers that are actually in there out of the AMM. 
Um, and then you go over to the gears and you have some, I don't want to get involved in all the projection angles and or global different numbers. Things can really look different. And if you don't understand the tool that you're using, and I know it happens all the time because you get phone calls all the time, they get confused. And so it's, I understand what each of them do, how they work, you know, how they're presenting their data. And so therefore, when I'm looking at the different systems, uh, then I can discern and understand it. And even with our AMM system, that Paul Hema system, Doc Neal uses the same system. But when you look at uh, kinematic data, he says the top of the swing is when the pelvis transition and AMM is when the club transition. So you could look at those two sets of data. And I mean, they're going to be the same, but if you don't understand which one's the top of the swing on which one, you're going to get confused really fast because his top of the swing starts at the pelvis transition and AMM starts at the club transition. And that just puts them, you know, a ways apart. Right. You, you could look at two different things and <laughs> Like you said, if you don't know what you're looking at, you're going to really screw yourself up. Yeah, so I encourage all those that look into that to truly understand and, and don't take the things that you hear as gospel, especially positional data, without comparing apples to apples. And even, you know, to me, that's why when I that's why so many people come to me, because when I do this on AMM, I'm, I'm pretty anal about it. And my data is really clean, really good. And you, you know, I've had like one of my tour players one time is like, okay, we'll go to this guy. He's got an AMM get, and then they send me the data. I'm like, well, that's not you. They sent me the wrong stuff. Right. So I call back up and sure enough, they sent me and I'm like, well, how long did it take them to calibrate the system? He goes, Oh man, he's way faster than you. He did it in like five minutes. I was like, Oh, all right, well, you can't go there anymore and you have to start coming here and you just wasted your time because none of that's usable. Because you can, if you, so the quality, and then if you're, if you're, say you're getting 3D from a source, making sure that you get it from the same source is very important so that the data you collect on a player this year will be comparable to the data you collect next year. And then that goes back to me, leasing to the inertial systems of 4D and hack motion, that's really hard for me to get that data the same every time. And I do it like nuts, right? And so the average guy, or if a player has it, or you just, you know, speed is your thing, you really shouldn't be looking at the numbers. You should just be, the motion will be fine and the speeds will be fine and everything will be great and use it for training, but just understand it. You know, that, that's one of the conversations I had with um, one of the tech companies, or, or it wasn't the company, but it was one of their higher ranking regional reps, I think was his position at the time. And I, I didn't agree with some of their, their criteria that they were measuring. And, and we had lunch one day um, and I said, uh, but why, why, I, I said, this is a phenomenal thing. It, it does some fantastic measurements. I said, but you know, it, it it doesn't give it might give too much i said it's great technology and he said he explained it this way which made total sense he said well this is kind of the you got to look at it like an mri machine i'm sure you've heard this explanation plenty of times that it, it does give great stuff much better than an x-ray and much even better than nothing but it if the person interpreting it just like a doctor looking at the mri readout doesn't know what he's he or she is looking at and diagnoses the person incorrectly it could be catastrophic and just listening to you yeah. go over the differences in, in, in technology is great. But if the average Joe or even a tour player doesn't understand the, the minute differences between each system and thinks that they're going to be able to utilize both, it's, you just said there, no, it, you could really get messed up. Yeah. Well, just think of uh, just the differences in, in track man and the GC quad, you know, uh, okay. The both of them would be fine. But there is not a chance I'm going to let a player that's always been on TrackMan all of a sudden switch, especially not somebody trying to make millions of dollars a year because they've learned their feels on TrackMan and then vice versa. If they've, if they've come up on GC Quad, well, you can't have the face be different. <laughs> all of a sudden, a, a two 
face to the right is not a two face to the right anymore. And you're going to have to recalibrate what you saw and feel for all those years. That's not a good idea. Yeah. If somebody and, thinks that switching the lofts on their wedges from say 52, 56, 60 to a 50, 54, 58 throws them off. Just imagine what yeah. going from the high end tech will do to your game. Exactly. So yeah, understanding what you're doing um, and understanding it, and certainly, you know, having players that I coach bounce back and forth, it doesn't. And, and I have, you know, I am a track man guy, so I have track man, but I have players that have GC quad. Well, when they come, they have to bring it. And so we just use that because I don't want you delving into both numbers. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm okay. I don't care, you know, which which is which i mean they're all they're both functional enough for learning for sure but they can't be combined they're too different yeah and understanding a conversion rate you know when i check people's clubs to it's one of the first things i check because if their club don't fit them or even close how the hell are they going to do what i'm trying to get them to do and the local shop here is a digiflex uh, but the guy that I learned from, he, he and I can't remember the name of his, but it, it's one of the only ones certified by the American Engineers Association. But so we had to figure out the the difference between the local Digiflex and his system because his is dialed in and he's got the couple. He gets them calibrated every year, so so that I was giving somebody accurate information because, it, like you said before, it's not apples to apples, it, it, even at the highest levels of technology. So hopefully people get that from from your explanation. Yeah, well, I hope so, because that's been a lifelong fight. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just I, to be able to, to have those conversations. And, you know, and I get data from other 3D systems all the time. And, you know, I my mind really is in AMM. So a lot of times it takes me a minute to go, okay, now this is this and this is how it works. And all right, and then I get it. Um, but it slows me down. I know that to, to have to shift over. I guess the easiest way to explain it for somebody who's who's not a coach or instructor hasn't utilized some of these things yet is, is it's like different dialects of the same language. You know, if you're in, yeah. like you're in in Dallas, if and I'm in in South Carolina, you know, we could go to the Northeast in, in Boston, and, and their dialect is completely different. Uh, and you go to to West Virginia, it's going to be different. You go to Chicago, you know, everywhere you go in the country. It's English, but the different dialects sometimes make it. You have to think a little bit before you understand what somebody's trying to tell you. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I was up in Nova, Nova Scotia not too long ago, and this guy for the whole day was talking about burns and the burn and the burn and the burn. And it was at the end of the day, I figured out he was talking about a barn. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, I was trying. I was looking for like, you know, hill burns and these things i'm like man i don't know what this dude's talking about and then it realized that you know every time it was there was a barn when he said that <laughs> <laughs> like okay so yeah just little things like that will confuse you to to no end i was confused for about six seven hours <laughs> or even anybody from the u.s goes over to the uk and, and the i mean everyone's speaking english but again the dialect's completely different yeah sure um, saying one thing means something totally different right Let, let's talk a little bit about coaching uh, in today's world because you've been in and around the game for quite some time and probably in one of the biggest technical the te- uh, technological areas uh that we've seen and as we've talked about um how, how much better has, has all the tech made golfers you know their, their scores coming down whether it be a tour player or, or the average joe um, well, I think it's made a lot of difference. I mean, you get the argument from the old school, oh, you know, that, oh, this and this and this, but the quality of players that we have in this world right now is astonishing. And, you know, some of that is that better athletes come to golf earlier. That's for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I get lots of tight ends and the kid that would have been the quarterback on the team. I mean, I see lots of those now that would have never happened 30 years ago, but there's no denying that being able to understand better what the human body can do and how it functions is helping coaching. 
And, you know, you hear those fights all the time. Well, I don't need all that stuff to get. And then they're right. They're, they're not wrong to that degree. But just the track man, let's just take track man for the example of, you know, everybody thinks this is this too mechanical. It screwed up the game. Well, I'm different with them so much. The track man is the ultimate feel machine. And like right now I have, uh, you know, two corn fairy players that are up and coming playing very, very well. And I made them both get track man. And so that, you know, they're standing out on the, on the tee in the morning before they play even with their track man on and seeing how ball, far the ball flies, you know, how far is it flying today? They're going through their just feels. They're not looking at their swings. They're not looking at the numbers of the path and the face, you know, and or when they do, they're realizing maybe they're having to practice or warm up in a hard crosswind. And they can see that they're actually mentally adjusting. Let's say it's a hard left or right. And they're shutting the face more just to get, that shape that they're used to seeing and this makes them aware they're doing that and then the first time you know instead of what we used to do you and i were out there and we're practicing that hard win all of a sudden we we get to the first tee and we snap hook it mm -hmm. right and we're like where did that come from and then we got to go back to the range after it's over well these guys already feel that they start to understand that's one of the things i teach now is you know, you've got to know when you hit the ball what that shape should be like, and then that gives you a really good sense of how much the wind is affecting your ball. And so we, I want them to understand what their stock swing feels like, and, and they can throw a number on it, and that's fine, but it's a feel. It's not a mechanic. And then when that shot doesn't come out the way they want, they have information that they can use for the next shot in that situation or the, you know, that direction or the other way, or, you know, how much is this wind really affecting my ball flight? And so when they sit out there and they get their wedge numbers, they get their numbers and it's, Hey, it's 30 degrees this morning at tour school. You know, we're out there this last year at tour school and it's 30 degrees and the guy can go, okay, well, my ball's flying 10 yards for shorter right now. And he steps up on the first two holes and he birdies both of them. You know, and I'm going to go, that technology helped us because no way those balls were going to get to the hole if you didn't, because your your mind is not going to translate that like it would have, you know, in our day. Like, we're going to be short for the first few holes until we can just believe it, right? Yeah, I think the old way was every 10 degrees under 70, you lose five yards. It was something like that. It was a total yeah. total estimate. And, and, you know, your, your brain still doesn't register it for a couple of holes. Mm -hmm. So maybe we bogeyed those first two holes and now the players can birdie them. And, you know, so I just think it's helped a lot. And then with me, with the 3D, we look at that and being able to track these players over 10, 12 years, you know, when they're 17 up to maybe now they're 30 or something and, and we can see if there's an injury happens, what's changed in the swing, is anything, you know, aggravating it, is it doing this, is it doing that? Having that information is not hurtful, it's helpful. And it's proved itself to be helpful every time. There's certainly been a, a few times I've told a player, dude, you're you're getting too technical with that track, man. Let's, you know, dumb it down and you know, turn this numbers off and let's just start seeing, you know, the carry number or something like that. Sure. But that's part of coaching too, making sure you understand the player and how much information to give and how much information not to give. Yeah. The, the knock on the, on any measuring device and your flight scope track, man, your the 3d, all of that is, is it, it's at least in my opinion, it's, it's the coach's responsibility to, as you just said, once the, the student, the kid, the tour pro, whoever it is starts trying to play by numbers then it's your job to get them back on track no no no, no. We're, we're not going to look you're not going to look at a number every time unless you're trying to develop that feel but to say uh hit if they're working on their driver or, or let's say a week later they come in and they hit a couple drives and say what, what's my launch what's my spin because that i see that become almost addicting to some of these younger kids especially and i was on a podcast just yesterday that we talked about injury and, you know, these young kids, what is, what do you see? I said, well, what I see is them trying to get four up on the, 
on the driver and they hang back mm -hmm. and you know and they're obsessed with four up and they're not noticing that their pelvis just moves seven inches forward and their the thorax moves seven inches backward and that ain't gonna make it you know when they start getting older and older and older and something's gonna get sore so you know it has to be a balance for sure you know but i do i'll sit there and all the time you know players i'll say i want a two one draw i want a six three shot i'll do that but i want them to the number should reflect a feel not a number or and, you know, i call it a point of reference right if you're yeah, gonna have a feel so you gotta have a good to point of reference to to to, to go off of Right. I think that's a great way to say it. I, you know, I wanted to know what does zero path feel like to you? You know, to me, it feels like I, I just swung 20 yards right. So that's my zero point. If I want to draw it, it better feel like I swing more than 20 yards right or it's not happening or I need to hit a pull draw. So, you know, that's just our feels. And I think those Dutch technologies do help them understand their feels and understand the real and the feel and how to match those things up. And, but certainly, you know, I mean, just like anything, you know, I mean, aspirin's really good unless you, you know, take four bottles of it. <laughs> right. What, um, in your opinion, what, what makes a really good coach? Is it their use of tech? Is it knowing the swing in and out, uh, their experience in teaching, the way they communicate, uh, since, since you utilize so many different things? I would think it's the communication and the passion. So like I say back then, you don't have to have all this tech to be a good coach. If, if I'm in the room with the player and I'm passionate and I get them to believe, what does it matter? You know, they're going to succeed probably a lot of the times, even if what I'm saying maybe isn't perfectly correct. But if I have passion and I can get a guy to run through a wall for me, we're probably going to do okay. And if I can communicate skills and certain practice habits and, and ways to go about you, you know, about being, let's just say a professional, uh, I think that's pretty important. And then when I, when I see that I don't do that, then I fail. And, and it, it happens more going into the pro rank ranks. You know, I, I try to tell all these guys, you know, on the mini tours. Okay. So, if you're out with all the guys and, and they may be beating you score wise, but if you're out there in the, in the, in the gentlemen's establishments, I'll put it that way. <laughs> if you're out there in the, in the casinos, cause many tars were all were around the casinos. You don't have enough money to be in that casino. So sleep there and leave. But if you're with that group and that group has been, talking about being at this casino every year for the last five years, you're in the wrong group. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to do the right things. You need to prepare to be at the show and you need to prepare. And, and to some degree I, I weed them out that way too, but it's always disheartening to me when I watch them go down that wrong path and I'm not able to stop them. And that one, that's always my biggest failure, my di biggest disappointment in my coaching. And maybe that makes me a great coach because I worry about it so much. And, you know, I don't worry about near the, the times when I've helped players that maybe didn't really want to play competitive golf, steer them away from it and just play golf instead of not competitively because they're having more fun and the pressures that maybe that they're being, having put on them to be competitive versus have fun and, and maybe they just play for fun. I mean, that's when I feel my most success. You know, I have, I have a young lady that comes in every summer. I don't know if she's going to get to come this summer because of what's happened, but you know, she went to college and she didn't play golf, but yet she's graduated. Now she's a filmmaker out there in, in LA, but she plays golf and she has fun and she comes in here and we talk and we're friends and, and, you know, I don't have that tour success story with her, but I got a life success story with her and that I love. And, you know, she didn't go off to college and play golf. Wasn't her choice, but I actually helped her decide not to do that. And I thought that was a good bunch of coaching on my part. And now she's very successful in doing other things, you know, so. So I don't know. I think that's the, what makes a good coach is the passion and the, and the investment. 
in the players. I mean, I live and die with all their shots. I'm sure you do too. Mm -hmm. You know, any good coach does. I mean, I was out playing in a tournament last year and I realized, uh, somebody had asked me about that because this other guy was making some birdies in my group. And, and I was like, you know, I, I'm a lot more adept these days at rooting for other people to make birdies than I am myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I said, wow, has things changed, right? So that was a revelation I had last year, last summer in some tournament I was playing in. Um, but I was really happy for this guy making birdies, and I didn't even notice if I had made one or not. You know, the most difficult thing that I found, and it's usually with very, very talented and I'm talking about mostly kids, meaning high, late high school, college, and early in their pro career, maybe just turned pro. And, and no matter how long you've been with them and how much uh, they might trust you or you've helped them so you develop that trust, sometimes getting them to do the, the thing that they need the most, they, they are extremely either reluctant or they don't have the trust in that little thing because maybe they have an insecurity um, or the hardest one I found is if they're ex 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 uh, extremely talented and they've relied on their talent, but you know, better than I do, um, that once they get to the, the highest level, that talent's not going to carry them because everybody on the PGA tour is extremely talented. Yeah. And to be honest, that's what weeds them out. Mm -hmm. If they don't have that thing and you can't coach it in them, they're not supposed to be there anyway. And I kind of look back at that and go, you know, cause the, I say this all the time, the, every country club out here is, is, is loaded with D one talent that could win on the, on the swings, right. That could win on the PGA tour, but they don't have the mental capacity to win on the PGA tour. And you know, the, the D one colleges, you know, I'll come in here and the kids will in here. I said, I say, all you guys sitting in here right now, you're at D1 school and you want to go to the next level. Everybody wants to go to the next level. And you think that next level is swing. You know, that next level is your brains. Everybody in here, you know, if you're a D1 top five at a D1 school, you know, upper echelon, there's some that are lower. But if you're up there, you're already good enough physically. Sharpen the short game make a couple extra putts, but if your mind's not right and you're not going to do those things that it takes, the discipline, the writing, the note taking, the, you know, the, the, just the way that you're going to have to live your life in order to do that, the somewhat of a, a little bit of selfishness inside to make sure you're paying attention to you getting better. Um, that's weeds them out. You know, they're, they're not going to make it. And, and there's only, what, 125 jobs on the PGA Tour, and there's no openings. So good luck. You know, uh, I, Conrad was one of the first interviews I did, Conrad Ray at Stanford. Uh -huh. And Conrad and I used yeah, to play awesome. together. He lived here in Hilton Head. And um, he said that he's basically that, that all the kids today uh, coming through junior golf, that, that they're that they're looking to play Division One golf, can all swing the club. He said they – they look really hard at grades and grade point average, and they talk to teachers. Um, there are many kids around, or, and he goes to the junior tournament, so he he sees their attitude. Um, and he said one of his keys is he tries to get kids who have not peaked yet. He wants them to peak in college and or wherever they go after, not kids that have peaked in junior golf, which I found very interesting. I and think I, that's so smart. And obviously, his form is working pretty good. He's won a couple of national championships as a coach and one as a player. Yeah, I think that's, you know, because we've been having some discussions on some of these podcasts lately of when college coaches call me now. I can't remember the last time that somebody asked me how the kid was or what they did or their scores. They asked me, what's their ball speed? And that's a phenomenon that's really risen its head over the last few years. And it's, I don't think it's helpful. And how refreshing is it to hear, you know, a thing like Conrad going out there and actually trying to look at talent he can develop and really help. And I mean, cause how many times do we see it? I got, a, I got a kid right now that's a stud 
but he only swings about, you know, when he mashes it, 110 miles an hour, 108 miles an hour. And these schools are going to pass him up. I already know it's coming. And I know he's going to be great because mm-hmm. he has the he has the attitude and he just hadn't filled out. You give him a freshman year of some, you know, workouts and some food and some hamburgers. And I mean, the kid's going to be swinging at 118, 120 by the time he's a sophomore. And, and those are the and, most dangerous because they've learned every, course management. Their short game is dialed in because they can't reach the long or the par fives. And but then so they have all that foundation and then you give them 118 to 20 mile an hour speed. And it's just get out of the way. They're killer. Yeah, they're gonna, and this kid's gonna be that way. And you can, I can already hear, you know, the big schools. No, no, I can hear them. I mean, we've already talked to some of them, and you're just going, "That's a mistake. That's a mistake." You know, it's some little old school, but that's how, you know. And of course, Connor's not a little school. He's at a great school, and but to have that mentality at a great school sounds so refreshing to me. Mm-hmm. Again, it's why he's probably one re- just one of many reasons he's so successful. Yes. And he's a great, I mean, he is a great coach and all the other things that come along with that. Yes, he brings good the motivator. Full and, yep. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, what uh, of all the things that you utilize, and you utilize more than anybody I know, uh, which one's had the most dramatic impact on your coaching? and getting people improve uh golf site and you know like you saw the thing that the technology would be the mind meter when we use that and uh then secondary would have been the track man Mm -hmm. would be the next thing that i use the most but um golf site and and learning about how people think and how they they go about i think because i'm a middle coach first i mean that's just what i am i'm a middle coach that happens to know about technology and other things but um how to uh, how that helps me apply the technical i think is the number one thing is to be able to take the technical and try to switch it over into the mental concept would be uh, my number one thing that's why as i learn now i'm learning how to edit you know the videos Uh, when you see the the mental one you're going to see wow that's a lot different from the other one because i actually got a green screen and i'm actually starting to get some of the things that are in my head out and if i can start to coach more with imagery and stuff like that and then a new track man virtual thing has been great because we can get the people to visualize better when they can see it and i think those things have been good but definitely golf psych is the foundation of everything i do and 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 i treat that as a technology because of the test once i test somebody and i understand them and they can start to understand themselves i'll tell you another thing funny about golf psych is we when we take somebody and let's say like i did we did my wife she took the test and before she took the test i had a friend of hers and mine and her and me all right down where we thought she'd be and when she took the test, I had her nailed the closest. The friend was second and she was last. <laughs> and I find that to be normal because your perception sometimes of what you think you are or what you've been told you are um, or think or, or feel like sometimes uh, you're not the best judge of that until you see it in your mind and you start to learn about it because a lot of people first go i'm not that way and then they they hear well this is what that trait means and they start to go wow i I do i think exactly like that and it's just i didn't understand that or i didn't perceive myself as that and i think that's a that that to me is technology being used um in a really really good way yeah i agree 100 percent. we're um what, what do you think the next thing is in golf? I mean, technology has rapidly advanced everything in the, in the last 10 to 15 years. What, what do you, where do you see the next thing? The next technology thing? Yeah. The, just the, the next kind of big thing in golf since you've, you, you've lived through the, the 
I'm not going to date you, but the, the pre-technology, the, the <laughs> pre, <can't>. right? The, <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, I've lived through persimmon. <laughs> <laughs> right, so and let's go, we'll go the persimmon Bellotta here. There was no track, man. It was okay. You know, it, it wasn't even yeah. video, right? So you, you've come yeah. through pre-video, video, video uh, track, man, 3D, 4D, all of it. So it, it, I see. where do you see it going from here? I see augmented reality and AI. And it's already coming. I mean, even TrackMan now is utilizing AI. I mean, I'm doing the beta testing right now. So that stuff's pretty cool. And, you know, in 3D, we'll probably, you know, definitely be at some point very accurate uh, at the AI and not have to have a bunch of markers. Mm-hmm. Um, I see... We can already see it through this uh, virus thing that I can see us playing golf, you and I playing golf together and you're in North Carolina or maybe we're playing with somebody in, uh, you know, who knows, you know, Australia, you know, on, on some of on a golf course and it seems realistic and we can go out and have a foursome. Uh, Michael Breed kind of, he foresaw that a while back uh, when I had a, chance to chat with him we were at dinner one night and and he saw that too and i think he's right i see that too as a as a even maybe even tournaments played that way because it's getting pretty good i don't know if you've seen the track man virtual no, stuff yet. some of these mm-hmm. simulators it's getting pretty ridiculously good i had uh uh three of my pros in not too long ago and we I was getting them all with the TBT shaft. So when I was in here building them, I just said, here, y'all play, you know, 18 holes and they're in there having a good time. And these are, you know, these are corn fairy tour players and, and they're in there having a ball and it was realistic. And they felt like, wow, we really, they really played. Right. And we set up the pins difficult in the whole nine yards and they had a ball. And so if I can watch, people that are out there trying to make a living have that much fun playing a virtual reality golf game, then I can see that that could be some fun for the average player that wants to play in a foursome and, and uh, you know, with somebody that maybe they hadn't been around with forever. And if we got, you know, FaceTime on the board over there and you got your, 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 your virtual reality situation, you know, I just see that coming. I see the new iPad. I don't know if you've seen that has the augmented reality things that you can already do with the LiDAR uh, camera it has. And my mind's already gone a thousand miles an hour on that of the videos I can make with a LiDAR camera and augmented reality where I can, you know, bring a player in here and I can put that bunker in front of them in reality where they can see it or, you know, things like that. You know, I've already seen technology where the cameras are in the room projecting a hologram down of a swing and stuff like that. So I know that stuff is coming. So there's a there's a lot of cool things on the horizon. And the only problem we have, the biggest problem I have with cameras based stuff is that once you get the camera, they only make so many. And by the time everybody's figured out that that camera's good, there are five cameras down the road and they may change the technology. So that's always been a problem with cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, if a camera based anything. And so that, I, that, that always kind of worries me when you go out and, and, and spend a bunch of money on a camera. And then next thing you know, I guess we all don't have to We do it all with iPhone now. So uh, as the iPhones get better, the, the actual cameras get better. And you'll see that whole video that you watched on my wrist angles and the one they'll see, that's all done on an iPad and an iPhone. Yeah, it's and getting it, amazing. Right. So so that's, yeah, that's probably where I see it all going is just, you know, just more virtual reality stuff, more uh, AI stuff coming down the, the pipe. I would imagine over in Asia, the virtual reality stuff's going to really take off. I mean, already their simulator business is off the chart um but that's probably going to happen and it, if we were a little ahead of the curve now during this virus you know it could have been some 
even though most of the golf courses were already open and every, I mean, the ones that here are open are packed. I don't know about where you are. Oh yeah. They're, they're t- everybody's working from home, right? They're mm. all on the golf course, <laughs> you know, and the, but I could see where, you know, a lot of people would have got some benefit out of that. Now I've taught a bunch on the Trackman simulator. Again, I'm a Trackman guy. There's other ones out there, but to be able to zoom and, and, uh, teach it's been very effective because i could come in i could take over their computer at their home i got the track man we can do the virtual stuff we can play coals we can you know look at video online and it was very uh real the only thing that i couldn't do that i love to do is grab them (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. and move them somewhere and that's been the only limitation but other than that it's really been no different than them standing and you know, we've been able to uh, really get some good work done, even though I haven't had anybody that I could physically be in front of. It, it could be one of the positives that come out of this crazy time that we're in. Could be. Well, I've learned a ton just in the in, in that part of it, you know, that I've resisted because I'm a guy that likes that one-on-one interaction. I'm not too into the more than one-on-one interaction, but I'm into that. Mm-hmm. And I, I like standing in front of somebody and teaching. I think that's what drew most of us into the teaching coaching world. Let's uh, let's uh, do some rapid fire and then get you going. I'm sure you've got Mrs. is probably going to get on you pretty soon. Been on podcasts all day. She wants to spend some time with her husband. Yeah. Um, let's see. She's if, reading a book. She's fine. <laughs> she might make, she's she that, be like, go do another one. I'm good. Book. I too. She's on that focus side, so she's fine. Give her a book and a chair and a a little bit of a breeze and some ocean wave sound, and she's good to go. Cool. Um, let's see. If uh, if you could have anyone swing throughout history, who would it be? If I could have anyone swing throughout history, who would it be? Mm-hmm. I've never thought about that. You know what I'm going to say, and it's going to blow everybody's mind, but by far the best ball striker I've ever seen would be Lee Trevino. It's nuts. All right. And nobody wants his swing, but through the ball, I can't imagine anybody's ever been better. And he amazes me even today watching him hit balls. Mm-hmm. Uh, best golf course no one's ever heard of since you've played uh, so my many. My favorite would be, yeah, more people are knowing it, but Victoria National. Where's that one at? In Evansville, Indiana, they now have the web finals there, but it's a Fazio course that this little guy built. I was a member there for a while, and it's absolutely my most favorite course. My favorite course before that was Spyglass, and I got introduced to that, and I was actually a member. I just can't get up there anymore, Um, but in Evansville, Indiana, I mean, there's a riverboat casino, one hotel, and this best little steakhouse you've ever been that there's no way you would walk in there unless I, somebody took you in there because mm-hmm. it's looks like the absolute dump. <laughs> Those but, are the best I ones. Mean, <laughs> oh, it's so good. You know, and you know, so everybody I've ever taken there, just, you want to go back, but you know, Evansville, Indiana isn't very big. And if you get out there to see Victoria national, it's spectacular. Cool. Uh, biggest pet peeve. Golly. You got some good questions. <laughs> My biggest pet pet peeve. Um, I even wrote it in a in a deal today on a forum. Would definitely calling out other instructors and saying they're wrong and then not giving back up. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't mind if somebody calls me out and says I'm wrong, but tell me why. Um, that would probably be in golf wise. That drives me insane yeah i think that's amongst the respected coaches and instructors that, that that's a very common not not pet peeve but everyone's kind of getting tired of the the trolls on social media just throwing shit out there and not coming back with anything just you're wrong okay yeah i didn't even know i had a pet peeve until i answered that one. <laughs> uh most underrated player on tour underrated player on tour now or forever uh we'll go now underrated player on tour charles howe you guys a machine Mm -hmm. 
just the cash machine. I mean, really hadn't materialized into wins, but he's a machine. So I would, I would just throw him up there right away. And I mean, maybe I'm a little biased cause he's, he's a friend of mine and, and I really like him and he's a great guy, but just when you look over the year and his, I mean, the guy is like always there and he's got, you know, making cuts and doing all that. And probably, you know, from his pedigree, probably should have won more um, as every, you know, who says probably, but you would have thought he would have, but uh Definitely, you don't hear his name just thrown out there a lot. And you know, he reminds, reminds me of, uh, oh, now I've lost his name. Was it Gary Coke back in the day? Yes. Like, mm-hmm. That just is, I mean, just an absolute ATM machine. And uh, that's what uh, Charles reminds me of. So I would say definitely him. Great player. Great person. You're Walk up song if you were on the Ryder Cup on the first hole. <laughs> Walk up song, something ACDC. <laughs> definitely something ACDC. That'll even date me further. That definitely get everybody going. I would say anything from the Highway to Hell album. I'd probably <laughs> nothing gets me going more than ACDC. My favorite rock band is is Boston, but nothing gets the blood going like ACDC. I get it. Hopefully, most people out there listening will get that one. Have you have you seen that uh, video out there of the little kids, the little bitty kids, and they're playing ACDC for them, and they're they're like start jamming. They're like, "Yeah, this is great stuff." It's like, dude, this is forty years old. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and yeah. they go, "Really? That, this is, is it, great." It's that one, and I think the other one they played was uh, Led Zeppelin. Is that the one yeah, where the kids had the headphones? So. Yeah, ACDC and Led yeah, Zeppelin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. Uh, a couple more. Um, if they made a movie about your life, who would play you? <laughs> I got to come up with good ones. Yeah, I mean, come up with things you never think about. So if I played a movie, who would play me? Somebody nutcase, probably. It's probably a, a John Candy. <laughs> He, he he probably did god god bless him and god rest his soul but maybe that'd be that's the only person i could think of or a, a belushi <laughs> be a good one either one it could be either one of them. uh two more best era in golf best era in golf mm-hmm. like 2000 tiger yeah that was pretty good and i mean i don't know how anybody would you know i mean it was you know we didn't say my favorite golfer would have been Tom Watson, but all that was great back then. And, but, you know, watching Tiger do what he did for those few years was mind blowing. And when you live through both of them, you just go, that's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. And the last one, Oh, go ahead. People understand that. (laughs) I just don't think people really understand Tiger. When it was Tiger was Tiger. I just don't think people get that. Maybe the, 20 years from now, they have to do a documentary on him like they're doing on the Bulls. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's probably very comparable. I mean, Michael and him and maybe maybe Tiger's greater as far as sports and the impact that he had on sports worldwide. I mean, Tiger might probably is above that. Uh, that last one, based off that, it probably is a giveaway to your answer, but uh, this one I ask everybody. Uh, greatest of all time, Jack or Tiger? Well, it has to be Jack. I think Tiger's the best player that we've ever seen, and Jack is the greatest. Um, That's a good his way to record, put it. You know, I just think his – if Tiger beats his record, okay. I'll, I'll give it to everybody, but he's got to got 20 seconds too. You know, what is it, 20? Jack's at like 20 Something second crazy place. Like major. That. Yeah, so I mean – you know, and then and you can argue the field, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. I'm, I'm going Jack's the greatest ever and Tiger's the best ever. That's a very, very good assessment. I think so, somebody asked me one time, because of all the – and I think you're the 21st show I've done. Uh, it's about equal. And someone asked me one time, and I said, look, I, I, I give it to Jack now, 
but I th- think Tiger has played the best golf, but it's very difficult to argue against Jack's record. Not yeah, just the I majors, mean, but like records, you said, the, 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 all the going records, there's top. And, and if majors are the one, I mean, if majors are the criteria, then it is what it is. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, even Jack would, I, I would think he would say the same thing. And just like, you know, what, uh, was said about him you know i don't play that game i never played that game and jack never played the game tiger played and you know but you know the, the record if we got to go off of records then it has to be off of records and that's why you know even michael jordan you're sitting there looking at him you're greatest basketball there is no competition i mean yeah lebron's probably you know it, he's a truck right mm-hmm. i mean he's unbelievable and uh but he's not michael jordan he doesn't, it's not that. No. And that, that goes back to right when we started, you know, the, 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 how the mind plays such an important role the, and, and more so that the higher up you go in, in echelon of anything, the way people think. Mm-hmm. Um, so hopefully you got, you're going to be opening up sooner your courses. If someone wanted to reach out to you for a schedule lesson, learn more about you and want to come see you, what, what's the best way to get a hold of you? It's on my website, SinclairGolf.com, and then email me at J-O-N at SinclairGolf.com, and then they can get a hold of me that way, and that's usually the easiest. Um, calling here at the shop is not the easiest because I'm brain dead, and I don't answer that phone <laughs> like I should, like a good uh, a good responsible business owner should, um, but I, I'm usually sitting there uh, – uh, teaching. So yeah, just get a hold of me there and that's the easiest. Give me an email and you can hit me on the social media. It's John Sinclair on Facebook and then at JRS two I I at JRS I I on Twitter. And if I knew what my Instagram thing, I'd tell you, but I have no idea because I don't even know how to use it, but I am on there. <laughs> okay. I would imagine if you hit John Sinclair, you'd figure out where my thing is and know it better than me. Um, my good friend, Ryan Chaney, uh, beats me in the head about that all the time. And he's the one that I made set it up. And all of a sudden I got like 1500 followers. And I think I've put on there like five posts and he's done four of them. <laughs> so that's what I know about Instagram. <laughs> okay. Hey, this has I been awesome. At that. I think everybody, uh, you've got so much info. This has been great that a lot of people are going to, whether you're a weekend guy or a, aspiring pro you're on the tour i think anybody who listens to this or like loves golf is going to get a lot from it thanks for coming on john it's always a pleasure we always have some great talks and and next time we uh, get together lunch is on me <laughs> well i appreciate that I, I owe you to. one yeah oh you're two you after this you didn't buy the last time no i owe you two after that you got lunch last time and now you come on the show so now i uh, owe you two. Oh well perfect i like people <laughs> so good deal you enjoy right, the well, rest of the night and so say much. hi to missus I sure will. Take care. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. If you enjoyed it, you can find more information on today's episode and other topics at golf360.blog. There you'll find the show notes and links links related to this episode, as well as any other episode that we've done so far to date. If you're interested in improving your game and would like to learn more from yours truly by taking a private lesson, a half-day or multi-day school, club or putter fitting, you can reach me through the blog site or by email, pete at golf360.blog. So some of you may be asking, what is the golf paradigm? All you have to do is click on the homepage while on my blog site to discover how you can start playing better than you ever thought possible. Or you can simply sign up again on the blog page for my instructional videos where I give regular tips on all areas of the game to include the swing, club design and fitting, health, fitness and nutrition, the mental aspects, and equally as important, the integration of all those things together. I'm also on social media, and you can find me at The Golf Paradigm. That's P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M. And I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, also under the same name, The Golf Paradigm. Facebook is usually the best way to reach me for questions and or comments, and I look forward to hearing what all of you have to say.